Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. we got a special one for you today, a real special one. This is a throwback episode, all the way back to episode 141 with Josh Driver, which you probably hear us mention a lot on this podcast, and that is because it is a classic. This episode uh, really helped kind of pave the basis for a lot of the stuff that we've talked about since then, and it personally helped out me and Jacob and our buddy Michael, who was on this one. So, hey, all y'all people who, you know, don't know about Michael Pike, they, they fit to know about Michael Pike. He's on yep. this one. Uh, but, Jacob, how are you doing? Oh, doing well. Doing real well. So, yeah, it's a, it's a really good episode. Super fascinated to kind of get this back out there. Just because, again, like Andrew was saying, this has been a highly popular episode for us since 2019 when it first came out. And, and not only that, but also it's had um, – it, it, it is – in the first or second position of all past episodes with the most listener success stories that yep. came from. I mean, there's been hundreds upon hundreds of people who have killed bucks using what Josh talks about in this episode and gone out there and had, you know, one of their best seasons, if not their best season from this specific episode. Um, there was actually one listener. I was actually looking this up who that following year killed a 200 inch, uh, white tail in Kentucky using exactly what Josh talked about and, and played out perfectly and he killed that buck uh, in that early season time period. So, uh, again, a very, very important episode and really a staple in the Southern Outdoorsman podcast, to be 100% honest. Yep, that Hall of Fame episode. And uh, we wanted to throw it back out there because this is almost like 400 episodes ago now. I mean, we're in the 500s. Uh, it's been It's been quite a while since this was out there. So we wanted to kind of throw it back up. And, and this is a really good time of year to do it because the good thing about Josh's tactics is you can take them right now. You can immediately apply them. Yeah. And, you know, Georgia's open right now. We're getting really close in Alabama. I think Tennessee's getting really close. Mississippi. Mississippi. Well, like, actually, Mississippi's their velvet hunt. Yeah. It's probably take going on right around when this comes out so i mean all across the southeast i mean we're getting right into it so mm -hmm. this is something that you're going to be able to take and uh and, and go straight into the woods with it so uh anyways we're going to kick it on over man um this this really does, needs no more introduction uh but we just wanted to kind of give you a little background on what this episode is uh and and all the stuff you can get out of it specifically as it relates to a buck's core area so i, I think people are going to get a lot out of that but uh, jacob you got anything else before we yeah, kick I'll, it over i'll say this this is gonna be a very impactful episode for you i'm going to call it right now we'll get tons of messages from you guys so when you listen to this episode and you see the value this episode you know kind of brings to you please all we ask is to share this episode with some friends and buddies share on social media it doesn't matter Just share the podcast share the show and it greatly helps us out and gets everybody else extremely fired for this coming season for this season this fall so appreciate y'all watching appreciate y'all listening and uh we'll kick it on over to episode now it's gonna be mm, 512 512 with josh driver so thank y'all for watching thank y'all for listening Welcome back, everybody. We got another heavy hitter for you. Get your notepad out because this is going to be a long one. Uh, I'm sitting here with the ginger bow hunter. I'm sitting here with Michael Pike, who just killed a buck. So you're going to hear about that. I killed a couple pigs this morning, so you're going to hear about that in the outro. But most importantly, we have uh, another deer killer on for you, Mr. Josh Driver. Josh, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. Good, good. Um, Michael is the one who connected us. So, Michael, I'm going to let you talk about that. Yeah, so uh, years and years ago, uh, when I first got on the hunting beast, um, there was this guy on there named Autumn Ninja, and I was like, you know, there was a post about thermal hubs, and, and I was like, who who is this guy? I've never even heard of anything related to, to what a thermal hub is. Like, I, I wouldn't even know where, where to start with that. And, uh, and so I started going through all your posts and everything, and man, the, the wealth of knowledge, I mean, I guess, what, what, how old were you when you first, uh, got started hunting? I was, uh, 13 years old. And, uh. At first, I started gun hunting with my dad. So, did you, did, I mean, did your dad, did he teach you a lot of things, or did you kind of learn it on your own, or? He, he taught me some. He taught me how to hunt the wind, uh, hunt, uh, leeward edges, you know, use the wind in your favor. Uh, and hunt uh, terrain features to an extent. Of course, you know, I, I took and ran with it. Very cool. Okay. Well, Josh, give us a little more background about, you know, who you are, but also, like, what part of the country are you originally from? Uh, what I originally started hunting was a, a, a large piece of public land where I, where I 
come from that's uh it's real rough it's real hilly and, and bluff country is what i would call it a lot of bluffs and overhangs and really really steep rugged terrain in, in what state uh, it's is all that? big big woods mm-hmm. uh, uh, up in kentucky west kentucky gotcha awesome well let's kind of dive right into this you know uh, again michael was pretty excited um i don't know it was probably four or five months ago when he told us about trying to get you on because of some conversations that you guys had together uh, about some of these different topics when it came to just kind of locating, finding, and killing big deer uh, on public land and especially high pressure public land. Um, So what is kind of your background when it came to hunting public land and uh, what was that progression like for you, you know, from the time you started to like where you're at now, what did that look like for you? I don't know. That's, that's really a hard question to to answer. I, I kind of, I felt like I was spinning my wheels for a long time and I had to figure out something. So instead of just hunting a saddle, I had to hunt something like a, what I would call a, a compounded feature, which would be a, a bench running into a saddle, which has a thermal hub below it. You know, like, you know, a deer has to have a reason to want to go from point A to point B. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I started finding, looking and finding stuff like that on the maps. You know, now they all have terrain and, and cover and structure all create edges. Got you. Well, you just said some stuff right there that I really want to jump into. That's kind of interesting. You're talking compounded uh, features and funnels. Uh, first off, l- let me ask you this before we j- dive into all that. What got you to the point you are at today when it comes to, like your overall knowledge of topography and how deer use it? Again, was that something that your dad kind of helped get you started when you were younger and you just ran with it? Is it from a lot of personal experiences? You know, how did you kind of learn everything you know of today uh, from years past? You know, what was that progression? I don't know. I just, I just kind of picked up on it. My, my, my dad told me, you know, that the deer use the, the, he showed me that deer use the, the easiest point from point A to point B, like saddles, uh, things of that sort, benches. Uh, but then I, I kind of took it and, and I, and I don't know. I just picked up on it. You know, just, you know, seeing what the deer do, uh, seeing where the trails are, seeing how they bed, seeing where the scrape lines are at. It just kind of all clicked. I mean, it's, I, I just, I can kind of see it, you know, whenever I, I, I can take a nap, uh, map of a, a place I've never been and, and pick out, you know, where thermal hubs and the social hubs and the compounded features, you know, because all, all saddles are not created equal. Some saddles never get used at all, but some saddles get, get tore up with scrapes all in the middle of them. You know, it's, it's all, you know, they all play together, you know, and, and create a dynamic. Yeah. Now, I really... There's going to be a lot of stuff to unpack here, so I really want to kind of start from the ground up of your of your hunting strategy. And to do that, uh, maybe run us through one of your like more recent like good buck kills, I guess. Uh, kind of tell us that story and how it went down, and we'll kind of start building on that. Well, my my last buck kill, which I haven't hunted at all this year, but my last one was last year. Uh, and he was actually bedding in a clear cut, large clear cut, super thick. Can't hardly walk through it. And he was using that, that clear cut. That was his core. It was probably about 15, 20 acre core. And he was dropping down into a river bottom, you know, feeding on a lot of uh, aquatic growth. And then the brows up, up above. And I couldn't get on him. I couldn't figure him out. I, di- I didn't know exactly where he was at. So what I did is I set up cameras up in, in three or four different oak flats. And I would check those cameras every five six days and then once he moved into a specific oak flat i went and checked my camera he'd moved into it i went in three days later first time i ever set up on him first time i hunted him and i shot him and killed him mm. so i anticipated his move as his core shifted and his food source shifted i shifted with him which i, I that was the first time i'd even hunted him i hadn't even tried to hunt until that point can you give us a little more background on, on what that area was like so you said there's like a cutover up top and and yes. some like hardwood drainage is coming off of it. If if I got that. Yes, right. it's a kind of a rough. It's a rough terrain all around it. You know, it, it drops down into the river bottom, and the hillsides are uh, oak. But there's like some little oak flats along it. And years ago, this was uh, farm country, and when the state took it over, they planted pines and all this. Of course, the the pine beetles came in and was killing all the pines, so they come in and clear cut the the pines. It was probably about a about a fifteen twenty acre uh, pine cut over that they'd cut maybe about seven or eight years ago so it's really super thick in there and that's where and that's where he was bedding he was you know that's that's the area he was using was that that ridge stop right right around that that cut and i there was no way i could get in there you know i couldn't i couldn't figure him out basically 
so I so I anticipated the shift and could go ahead. Would you happen to know how old that cutover was at the time? About about six or seven years, I believe. Boom. All right, cool. Cool, cool. We've been talking about this a lot. This is exciting. All right, you guys. Kind of when it comes to uh, talking these cutovers, um, Josh, that's something that we were, like Andrew said, we've been talking about that a lot lately just because we found a pattern, um, or I should say Andrew and Michael found a pattern from Georgia, I, mean, I think like 165 miles from one property to the other property that the exact same age cutover was holding all these deer and all these big deer. Yep. Uh, which is very, very fascinating, which is right at that same time span where you're talking, you know, between, I guess, six and eight years, uh, roughly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for all those. So, yeah, it's a seven-year-old cutover in Georgia, slap full of deer, bucks all over it. And now in Alabama, me and Michael in the last three or four days, or I guess how many days? Four days. Mm-hmm. In the last four days, we both killed bucks out of that age cutover. So that's that's pretty slick. That's pretty cool. Um, so, man, I, I want to start un- unpacking this. Uh well, there's a lot of things to this. So there's a lot of different uh, topographical features I want to cover um, with you, Josh. You know, you talked about a bunch of different things when it comes to different travel corridors and how deer use different funnels and use different uh, terrain features uh, and talking like the compounding terrain features and funnels, uh, which we want to get into. Uh, but it's like, how do we want to break this down? So like, what's the very basic knowledge someone should have uh, to be able to kind of start, uh, you know, understanding some of these tactics that you're talking about and start implementing them? Well, that probably the most basic it would get is it's all about edges and edges are created by structure cover or terrain and it doesn't matter where you're at i mean it doesn't matter if you're in hill country or in you're in swamps and marshes or if you're in suburbia uh you know old mine strip mines farmland no matter where you're at bucks use it all exactly the same way and it's all about the edges okay now from going from the edges What's like the next step up? Like what's the next thing someone's going to have to know uh, to kind of start relaying and putting all this together and kind of, you know, putting all the pieces of a puzzle together to kind of map out what the deer are doing in their area. So like what's the next step up after they understand the edges? Uh, edges create, create diversity. I would say the next step would be to learn is to use those edges to your advantage with the wind with your entrance and your exit and the, and the wind you, you, you use those, those edges are the deer use those edges to their advantage, but that's the chink in their armor. You can also use those edges to your advantage, you know, with the wind and your entrance and your exit. And it's basically the only way to kill them is if they don't know you're there. So like <clears throat> if, if you're new and you're going in for the first time, um, are you focusing more on cover versus terrain? Um, or, you know, is it a mixture or one over the other? What, what do you prefer? It's, it's a mixture. I, now, see, I, I've changed over the years. I mean, from, from what I used to do to what I do now is like uh, 180 degrees. Uh, I used to hunt the rut, which I don't hunt the rut at all anymore. I mean, I don't even like to go into the woods during the rut. I, 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 I'll set the rut out. I don't even want to put my vacation during the rut anymore. And I look for diversity because that's what draws and holds deer. Okay. So the place with most diversity, that's where you're going to find most amount of deer. Now, I want you to explain for us, and we're going to kind of keep going in like step-by-step step, how someone can kind of learn and start understanding, you know, how to, you know, map out the deer in their area. Uh, when it comes to diversity and you wanting to set out the rut, you know, kind of explain that for the listeners. You know, some people probably think like, this dude's crazy talking about like not wanting to go hunt the rut, but, you know, what's the reasoning for that? And kind of what's your favorite time of the year to actually, you know, pattern these whitetail and go and kill them, especially on public land? Well, with variety, you have variety in food and diversity in terrain and cover. Uh, also some security of some kind, some water. Uh, and, and, and a lot of times it doesn't matter how much how much our area is pressured either. You know, it, it could be lightly pressured or heavy pressure. I mean, I killed deer right beside the road. The deer I killed deer, uh, last year, the one I was talking about that was in the clear cut, I could actually see cars driving up and down the highway from where I was sitting at in my stand whenever I shot him. You're talking about using uh, edges to your advantage. So can you, can you kind of unpack that a little bit? Uh, how to, First of all, how are deer using edges to their advantage? And second of all, how can we turn that around on the deer and use them to our advantage? Well, they use them to their advantage. The deer use, they travel along the edges and bed along edges. And they usually bed and travel with the wind. They'll not travel so much, but bed with the wind in their favor. 
but they've always got they've always got some sort of an advantage or what they feel is an advantage. It may not be an advantage actually, but they feel like it's an advantage, and it may be towards other predators that are in the woods. But if you understand how that works, then what you can do is you can slip up and slip up from the bottoms. So what I'll do is I always come in from the bottom or come in from open terrain or what I call negative terrain, terrain that the deer don't normally use during the daylight or when it's windy, winds are swirling, thermals are rising, uh, open during the day. Of course, darkness is the best cover of all. So uh, so what about this negative space you were talking about? Uh, can you can you uh, elaborate on that? I call it negative terrain, and it's, it's areas that the deer do not use during the day or typically use during the day uh, when your winds, you know, of course, of course, you know, everything's pretty much dead calm normally, you know, at, at night, in the evenings, early morning and at night. So during the day when your winds are blowing and swirling, your thermals are rising, uh, there's nothing consistent about your winds. You get all kind of eddies, mechanical turbulence. Uh, and then, of course, your your open fields, which, which during, at night, they're using them all the time because cover... You know, darkness is the best cover of all. So whatever deer do not use during the day, typically, I call negative terrain. So I use negative terrain to my advantage, setting up and with the wind, and only hunt the positive terrain where deer are normally at at night. You know, up on the ridges, on top, the benches, uh, uh, the thick cover, the woods, you know, the, the areas where deer are typically at during the day. Yeah, this is something we've been talking about a lot lately. Uh, I was talking to Michael about it uh, today, um, where the like we were talking about the hardwoods and everything, like negative terrain as you call it. And you know, it's like yeah, some deer will come through there in the daytime, and some guys might kill some bucks in there every once in a while. But the amount of time that they spend in, in talking daylight hours here, the amount of time they spend in that stuff versus the thick cover is like super, super disproportionate. So my my question is, in that thick cover, what kind of activity do you typically see throughout the day? Uh, well, I, I set up cameras a whole lot. I actually got a got a, a series of photos for about a six weeks just this year of one uh, camera I let soak. I normally don't let the only reason I let cameras soak are for study purposes. Uh, they really don't help me kill anything you know, other than just learn it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the deer would bed and get up and move around and browse, come back and bed get up, move around, and browse, come back and bed, get up, move around, and browse, and get back. And I would say they may even be bedding in other spots off camera, but they're using like a like a 100-yard a square foot area type spot, and they'll get up and bed. And then they'll browse around, they'll bed somewhere else. They'll get up, and they'll come back, and they'll chew the cud, and they'll lay back down. It's, it's kind of weird, mm-hmm. but, it's, but it's really not weird. They, they, they just use those areas. It's, but they don't just lay in one spot all day by any means. They'll, they'll, they move around a lot. Way more than you'd think. Is there any kind of consistency with those beds? <sighs> really big mature bucks, I find just kind of they, they will use the same bed, and and I've really not even found a difference in wind. I mean, they kind of the wind will be blowing around, but it's always on some sort of an edge. It gives them some sort of an advantage, but but they'll bed they'll bed in like the same spot all the time, and I've I've seen them bed in the same spot. It doesn't matter what the wind's doing; it could be blowing from the North, south, east, west. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. And they're still. They still bed in that that same same little area all the time. So I've got a question that I've been uh, trying to figure out the answer to here lately, and that it goes back to. So these deer, you know, they're bedded there. How are you approaching to kill them in that spot? Because a lot of times, you know, they they could be bedded there before daylight. Um, are you getting in there super early for that? Like. How are you attacking that? Or are you just hunting the fringe? I, I only hunt evenings. I don't. I don't hunt mornings. That's something I also quit. You know, several years ago, uh, I was wasting my time. I don't know where the deer is going to be at when I'm coming in and uh, you know in the darkness, mm-hmm. and that deer knows I'm there, and I have no idea where he's going to be exactly. I mean, I can set up on his bed, you know, or where he was bedded, but the chance of me busting him and that just being a wasted hunt—that's always in the back of my mind. Am I just sitting here for no reason at all? Did I bust him on my way in? So I don't even hunt mornings. Well, it, it makes sense too because you don't. Maybe you don't understand uh, unless you just have a ton, ton of history with a specific deer. You know how he's coming back to bed and what his routes are like. Because, like you said, you know you could run past him or run up on him in the dark and you not know he's there and you, you know, tip that deer off. That deer doesn't come back to bed. And like you said, you know you're sitting wasting a hunt because that deer. 
you know, got wind of you or saw you or heard you or whatever getting set up in the dark or walking in in the dark and, uh, you know, slipped off and did something different for the day. So that, that makes a lot of sense, too. Uh, I definitely feel like I have a lot more success in the afternoons. Now, I'm not – this is killing deer, not nothing in general, like killing big bucks or nothing. I'm, I'm not that guy. Um, but uh, that makes a lot of sense, too, because in the, in the, especially in the afternoons, uh, you know, outside the rut, I, as long as you know a you know, specific area where these deer are bedding and you understand their side advantage and their wind advantage, uh, you know, you can definitely use that against them, especially in areas with a lot of terrain. Uh, now I've got to ask you, um, you know, Josh, do you have much experience in any kind of flat country? You know, you know, I hear a lot of guys have a lot of issues with deer, uh, you know, seeing them in flat country, uh, whether they're trying to come through, you know, more open terrain to try to get to a spot that's thicker or whatever. Uh, do you have any experience hunting that more kind of flat terrain uh, in hunting those bedding areas? Uh, yes, yes, I do, and. Uh, but it but it was farm country. I mean, you know, so you had your you had your cover edges, mm-hmm. which basically act about the same way as your terrain edges, except in the fact that the wind is a lot more consistent. But the deer act the exact same way. Yeah, gotcha. uh, okay. Basically, the, the only big difference I can say is usually in your farm country, which you know, you, flat country could be anything. But the flat country I hunted was either either mine old mine property or uh, farm country. The, the only difference I've seen is the, the food source is more abundant, which is harder to key in on because it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. Well, let's let's talk about that then. How do you implement, you know, an area when it comes to, uh, you know, kind of keying down a food source? You know, right now, I'll kind of give you an example. Right now, we are in um, the rut in our area of Alabama uh, that we're all hunting. And the deer that... <laughs> We're, we're actually finding very limited to no feed sign anywhere where there's oaks. Just kind of like what I've seen. That's what Andrew's seen. Mike, have you seen kind of the same thing? Yeah. Okay. So in, in areas where there are oaks, but there's also a ton of pines and everything, uh, you know, we definitely are seeing a lot of deer, believe there's more deer feeding in those thicker areas and those thicker pines um, and those cutovers. How is there any way um, that you've done in the past kind of target those areas where literally where the deer is bedding, He's in an area where there's a hundred acres of, you know, food, somewhat water, and unbelievable cover, and they literally don't have to leave that much unless they want to chase a doe out in the open. Um, have you ever ran into a situation like that and actually been able to get on deer in those areas? Yes. Yeah, yes, I have. And uh, sometimes you have to, like, I work on the railroad and I get very limited time off. The only time I can hunt is like on a vacation day or a personal day. I don't get very many of a year and I've learned to use my time extremely wisely. And if there's a deer that I can't get on, I move on to another deer. There, there's a big difference in hunting deer hunting and hunting a specific deer. Mm-hmm. And, and I've, I've the last you know several years, I've started hunting specific deer, which you hunt totally different than hunting just any deer. And if I can't set up on a specific deer, I move on to another deer that I can set up on. Okay, I got a question for you. We've had we've had I'll say one other guy on the podcast who hunts specific deer on public land, and that's Jeff Homan down in South Alabama. Uh, he uses trail cameras to backtrack them back to their bedding areas, and then sets up on them and, and kills them. Has really good success doing that. What is your technique or style of locating a specific buck and going about you know kind of learning about that deer and going in and actually killing him? I, I don't know if you can run us through a scenario where that's happened for you in the past. I use trail cameras as well. Uh, and the main reason I use trail cameras, like deer that I want to kill are usually top end from my area. You know, they're 140, uh, 140 plus, you know, maybe 150. You know, most, most mature bucks, if he's 150 plus, he's, he's mature. You know, he's, he, well, I'll say mature, mature for me. I, I call a four year old a mature, but, you know, a mature buck. Uh, and they make up about one out of every 35, 40 bucks that are, that are roaming the woods where I'm at. So basically, if I'm hunting beds, I'm wasting my time. I need to hunt that buck in his bed if I want to kill him. So I don't, I don't, I don't look for buck beds and hunt buck beds. I, I look for that buck, that buck specifically, and I try to find his bed specifically, and I set up on him specifically. And I use trail cameras. I usually run around 20 trail cameras a year. 
Okay, now a question I got to ask you: You're talking about your time's very uh, limited. You know, you don't have a whole bunch of time to go out and hunt. So, how do you go about running your trail cameras? How often are you checking trail cameras, and how often are you moving trail cameras to stay on a specific deer or locate a specific deer that you feel is worth chasing after? I'll move them all the time, and I'll do them like on my time off, just in between in between the times that I work, like usually uh, twelve, one, two, three o'clock in the morning. I'll go, I'll go check them, run them, move them around. I'll move a trail camera about, I'll let it sit for about five, five to seven days and I'll move it to another location. I'll let it sit for about five, seven days. And I just rotate them, just move them all around into areas that I believe are cores because cores can be predictable. I mean, you can go to an area that you've never been to in your life and, and find a buck score, you know, because they're, they're, they're predictable. You, 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 you kind of look at the, the diversity, uh, variety, the, the water security, all that stuff we were talking about earlier, the edges, and you can find a buck's core by, you know, just by, by looking at the environment. Now, this is something that really, really relates to one of our past guests, uh, Jeff Homan. We did an episode with him about backtracking bucks with trail cameras, and he he hunts very, very similar stuff to what you're talking about. So he'll he'll let a camera sit for like five days, He'll go in there and he'll see what's on it. And then based on what's on it, he'll move it. And he's basically trying to figure out, like you're talking about, this buck's core area. And he's trying to get close enough to where he can catch it in daylight. And I'm like, I'm, I'm pretty good buddies with Jeff. He shows me where he hunts. We hunt together sometimes whenever we can. And the areas that he hunts are super diverse. Like you'll have five different forest types coming together where you got cut over, one age pine you got a hardwood bottom then you got a different age pine and then maybe even a different age pine after that and there's just all these different kinds of habitats all coming together and that's how all his spots are are just like very diverse and they're all real thick so i mean that sounds like it lines up extremely well with what you're talking about so my question for you is when you go and check your trail cameras what makes you move them or well, let me rephrase that when you move them, what are you trying to move them towards? Sometimes, you know, it's, it's the weirdest thing. I can go into an area that I know is a buck score, and I can set a camera up and leave it for a week and not a little picture of a buck. And I can have another camera set up 50 yards from it and get 15, 20 pictures of a, of a specific buck on that camera. It's, it's the weirdest thing. Uh, sometimes I may just move it around a little bit. If I know that a buck's in the area, you know, Based on history, uh, based on tracks, you know, in, in the in the logging roads, think or pre, uh, river crossing things of that sort, I'll just move it around. But if I don't have anything on it, I'll just take it to a whole new location. So, well, I was gonna say, Josh, real quick, I want you to touch on this. Um, what are you looking for when you're trying to set a camera out? What are you setting it up on? And and exactly, you know, what are you trying to move it to? Like, say you're not getting exactly what you want. You know, but you know there's a deer in the area. You know, what are you setting it up on? Are you setting it up on scrapes, trails? Are you doing creek crossings? Are you doing, uh, you know, a terrain feature edge? What, what are you looking for to set a camera up on, and how do you go about moving it if you need to adjust it? Whenever I'm moving my cameras, I'm keying in on edges, and I'm keying in on those cover edges, terrain edges, structure edges. Uh, outside of the rut, bucks kind of key away from what I would call uh, social hubs. You know spots that connect uh, multiple deer units so like when when you're looking at these edges and you're setting up on edges how far you know from the exact edge are you are you do you have these cameras set up on like um do you do you prefer them in one you know type of cover versus another or you know is there anything that for the you know, for somebody who doesn't have any experience with this, is there anything that you could, any kind of pointers or anything? Uh, no, not really. And, and I'll set them up perpendicular. You don't want to set them up right with the edge or, or, or parallel. You want to set them kind of perpendicular to it, you know, so you get your bet, your absolute best, best chance of a shot. And I don't care if I'm getting nighttime pictures. If I'm trying to find a buck. It doesn't matter if it's nighttime pictures, daytime pictures, what kind of pictures, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to find, and, and, and during the summer here, especially in, in July and August in Kentucky, uh, the summer on a water source or near uh, an edge close to a water source is a really good bet. You know, because water is like your most, that's, that's your most scarce commodity, you know, at that, at that time of year. How many of these, uh, how many of these cameras are you, uh, 
are you putting in these core areas to get a certain deer? I will usually to try to find a specific deer I want to hunt. I'll use two to three, two to three cameras in an area that I believe is a core or has been a core in the past because these, these same areas will be cores year after year after year. Hmm. Uh, they may skip a year, skip a year, you know, and another mature buck will move in and, I will use two to three cameras in each area. And then once I find a specific deer that I want to kill, then I'll move five or six cameras into it. And then I'll run them and I'll figure him out. And I mean, I'll go in during the day and find out exactly where he's bedding, exactly how he's moving and everything. And then I'll pull them completely out. I might move one or two just to soak a little bit. And then I'll go in and kill him. So you're starting with less cameras and then ending with more? Like you're putting... Yes. And how many acres... You know, would you say you're covering? What do you think this core area is? Man, that's that that's that's a specific deer. You have you have no idea. Uh, it's much much smaller on a, on a big mature buck. It's much smaller than most people believe. And a lot of times they they try to they try to equate on your collar studies and things like that. They try to equate core areas, you know, to the rut. And and I mean, I guess that's correct, but everything just kind of goes way off kilter and it throws their data way off whenever they start trying when they start trying to compare that to actual size of the core they start trying to compare what what's happening from let's say where i'm at october the 25th till december the 5th it throws everything way off you know because they're they're out looking for does all over the place the buck that's here maybe three miles over there today the buck is three miles over there today maybe here tomorrow Josh, something you just said uh, before we get talking about that, when you're talking about running cameras, that was kind of interesting. Did you say something about going in and actually like bumping that deer to find out exactly where he's at and then backing out? Yes. Okay, I want you to talk yes, about go, that. Yes, I'll, I'll go right in on top. I'll, I'll go right right where he's at. But he's not going to go anywhere. I mean, the, the, you know, bucks get bumped all the time. They get bumped by squirrel hunters. They get bumped by coyotes. They get bumped by, by trees that are falling in the woods. I mean, bump, they get bumped all the time. They don't. Outside the, you know, they don't they don't really pay much attention to, to us. That's that's kind of crazy. You know, somebody thinks that that, a, that a, you bump a deer and, and he's gone, you'll never see him again. That's because they bumped him during the rut, and he's for three miles over there. He's never coming back anyway. That's hmm. why they never seen him again. Got you. So I got to ask, when did you start doing that, and how did you go about start doing that? Like, when did that click for you? Like, hey, I can go and I can kind of bump this deer out of his Dead, bay, uh, daytime bed and then go back in ever how long or, or you know how many days or weeks later and go kill him out of his bed or in that area i i did it in the past i, I killed one on a he was bedding on a riverbank one time and it was kind of an accident uh there was a huge there's a huge community scrape about 50 yards from where he was bedding but i slipped in there and all of a sudden i heard him hit the river and I looked over, I walked over to the bank. I was probably about 50, about 15 yards from the bank. And I walked over to the bank and I seen him come out the other side. It was a big 10 pointer, scored 164. But I set up the very next weekend, I set up on that community scrape and I watched him swim the river and bed in that bed and lay there until about 11 o'clock in the morning from about just, just after daylight to 11 o'clock in the morning. He got up, browsed around two or three times, never did offer a shot. At 11 o'clock in the morning, he came over to work that community scrape, and I shot him. Oh! <laughs> That's cool, man. That is awesome. That is super freaking Dreams awesome. Dreams are made of. I'm going to dream about that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Josh. So, okay, so you, you said you, you kind of had some experience there. You know, how long have you been doing that? How long have you been, you know, once you kind of find out there's a deer in the area, going in, bumping him, and then trying to set up on him later, and – after you answer that, I want you to kind of answer, you know, how long do you normally wait after bumping a deer from his bed from going back in there and killing him? I, you know, in a, in a mature buck's core, in his core area where he stays all the time, as long as you're not real crazy with, with cutting limbs and spreading sin all over the place, I, you could probably go in and kill him the very next day. I mean, he, he's, he's bedding there for a reason. He's bedding there because he feels safe. I mean, that's, that's why he's bedding there. And, and one bump, one bump is not going to do anything. If you bump him over and over and over, day after day after day, he's going to go somewhere else. But, but just a bump, he's, he's not going to go anywhere. And a lot of times I don't even see the buck when I bed. He usually slips out before I ever even see. I find the bed, and I never even knew he was there. I just find his bed. Gotcha. All right, so this is a question, and 
sorry for almost interrupting you right then, but uh, this is super exciting because I, I find this really cool because I can kind of start thinking of like, I mean, there's areas I know of that I think I could go in and kind of do this a little bit better and uh, and maybe try to implement some of these tactics. And I think listeners are thinking the same thing too. Uh, when it comes to, you know, bumping that deer out of his bed, you know, you talk about like you don't like hunting mornings, but how would you go about hunting – a specific bed if you know that deer got up out of it before right before you got there whether you saw him heard him or you know that he was just in that bed and it's a daytime bed how are you going about trying to hunt him you know you spit you talk about hunting mostly afternoons are you trying to slip in as close as possible or what like mine i just jumped yes. that buck the, what two days ago and uh it was raining he was in the mountain laurel thicket on the side of a hill uh I think the wind was coming out of the uh, north that day, but he was bedded on the north facing slope. Right so in the been face. Right in the face. Um, so <clears throat> we're supposed to get another rain in the morning. Mm-hmm. Would would you just jump right in and 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 get over there and you know would you try to do it in the morning because I mean that's that was kind of my plan. Until, initially <laughs> until, you, until you said you don't hunt morning so yeah, yeah. So, so josh trying, trying to recap on that again if you find his bed kind of like what michael did if michael find a bed in a, in a mountain laurel thicket on a north facing slope would you go in and hunt it if you know it's his like mid, his midday bed or, or you know morning bed would you go hunt it in the mornings or again would you try to hunt it in the afternoons and you know how do you see that being you know successful for somebody because again you talk about only hunting the evening so kind of you know relate that with us if you don't mind well, during the rut, during the rut, mornings are great. And that, uh, I would rather hunt mornings during the rut. And I would definitely try to sit up on that deer, uh, you know, during the morning, during the rut. I mean, that's, that's totally, that's a totally different type of, uh, you know, type of hunting than what I do now. Mm-hmm. So you know, next, compared to what I, what I used to. So next question real quick. Uh, it's supposed to start raining tonight. And I just have this weird feeling that this buck is already going to be bedded down would you still stick to that same plan and try to be in there maybe like a couple of hours early and you know before daylight just to try to beat him back to the bed or do you try to slip in you know i just uh i have a feeling he's already going to be bedded down before i even get there because of rain man that's i have no idea i I wish you luck. <laughs> <laughs> how do you how, how do you see no, I, him? I, I, I wouldn't. I would. I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even be hunting right now if it's during the rut. Yeah. So I, it's just everything's just way too unpredictable, you know, and and chaotic and unpredictable. Right. I, just, I don't. I don't have any confidence in in the rut anymore. Do you do you see any kind of patterns as far as like deer and with them bedding down uh, with the rain, or do you think they move no matter what, or? You know, what are your thoughts well, on that? It, yes, if it's a downpour, deer will hunker down and they'll stay there. But if it's like, you know, a light rain or a drizzle, I mean, they'll, they'll move just like they just like they normally do. As a matter of fact, they may even move a little bit more on an overcast day, you know, with a, with a drizzle or a light rain. You know, Josh, the whole, your whole topic of, like, the buck bed and hunting that specific deer, um, you know, in an area like that is really interesting because I just actually picked up some more cameras and I want to do this just because Alabama season's so long. I mean, we go to February 10th here, uh, which is, I mean, ridiculous other than Arkansas. Arkansas goes to the end of the February, which is bananas because all the bucks have shed their antlers by then. Um, but anyways, you know, when, when it comes to, you know, hunting the uh, specific bed, I think that's kind of overwhelming for a lot of guys. I think a lot of guys that are listening right now, unless they're like a, you know, quote unquote, like, you know, a hunting beast member or like, you know, they're a beast hunter or there's somebody that hunts beds. Um, you know, I think that's kind of overkill for a lot of guys, but what advice would you give to somebody who's trying to implement all these tactics of like focusing on edge, you know, focusing on topographical features and train funnels, uh, you know, for either the, the rut, like especially the rut right now. You know, the rut in Alabama is kicking. Uh, Mississippi uh, seems like it's on fire right now um, and, and stuff like that. You know, if somebody like ourselves, because all three of us here are hunting the rut right now, I know you don't like hunting the rut, but what would be in an, in an area where you know there's a lot of deer there, what terrain funnel or feature or edge structure would tell you, like, hey, I want to sit here because I have the most 
uh, most chance of maybe seeing more deer in this area coming through this one specific location. Is there anything that you can think of that maybe you've had experience in the past or if you were going to go out on a, on a high – uh, high odds hunt where you're just trying you know locate a buck uh that's in the area chasing does you know what would you be setting up on when it came to like close to the bedding areas and everything else well they're they're in the rut i mean if you know where the does are bedded uh you can set up on the downwind side uh i've did a lot of that and, and all my terrain feature hunting was basically based on rut hunting it was uh inside corners created by terrain or by structure or by cover of some sort you know, the, the compounded features, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a lot of times you'll have one big ridge, bottom ridge, you know, connected to a, to another ridge, you know, with a, with a, uh, like a, uh, bench runs in between them. You know, you have like a low, a low, a low ridge with a low ridge and a high ridge up above it. I mean, I, I show all this on top of it. It's kind of hard to explain you know, on, on the phone, but if I was not in the rut, that's what I would have, which I don't, I don't really, I don't really do, do much of anymore. Uh, now I just kind of, I, I try to find more, you know, the buck scores and I'll find them with cameras and then I'll figure that core out and I'll set up on that buck in his core, you know, on his, on his bed. And of course, you know, how he uses that core and beds all relates to the, to the edges within his core. So going back to uh, the does, <clears throat> I have a problem right now. And that's uh, on one side of a ridge, a big long ridge that runs probably like a half a mile or maybe mm-hmm. uh, it's got green fields on one side. And then on the other side, it has uh, open timber, like open hardwoods. The does are bedding on the side with the open hardwoods, but they're bedded right on the edge of the pines. And I figure that, you know, these deer are feeding in those green fields, coming back over the ridge top, and then going to bed on that edge. Are these bucks still going to be cruising the downwood edge, even if it's, um, you know, open hardwoods? Or are they going to be cutting the trails at the top basically above you know catching the thermals and stuff like that i've I've seen rubs and scrapes on the downwind side and i've seen them on the uh on the upwind side so i'm having trouble trying to decide where to set up at now here's what you need to do you need you need to use the wind and the thermals to your advantage uh bucks do to a certain extent but and especially during the rut they just do whatever they're going to do. I mean, he's going to stick to the cover, but as far as your wind and your thermals are concerned, eh, not so much. So the best thing you can do is, is, is keep the wind and the thermals in your favor and don't really worry about what whether he's using the wind and the thermals in his favor. You know, he's, he's not really that smart. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, Josh, that's something that Andrew uh, noticed on the buck he killed on Sunday – uh, Sunday evening, um, he had uh, that buck cruise, you know, within like 10 yards inside that thick pines, uh, which, you know, this is a cut over from like 2012, so the pines are yeah. ever how tall, I don't know, 15 they're feet tall, but they're seven all Seven years up. old, about 10 to 15 feet tall, but spaced out enough that there's just a ridiculous amount of briars and honeysuckle beneath them. And really, now yeah. that I look back at it, he was about 15 yards it, well inside the pines uh, from the actual edge. He was like 15 to 20 yards in the pines. Uh, so if you're sitting at, like, you know, just watching the edge uh, from, you know, 20 yards out from the edge, you'd have never saw him. You might not even have heard him coming through because uh, he's coming through those pines and it was kind of quiet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. Th- thanks for taking that, Andrew. Um <laughs> You're but welcome, bud. In, so the areas that we kind of hunt, Josh, uh, and I think a lot of listeners in the southeast can relate with this is timber com- timber company uh, land. Uh, we hunt public land. It's all, uh, well, I guess owned by timber companies. The state pretty much leases them in Alabama, but a lot of people in, in Georgia, in Mississippi, can kind of relate with that. Where it's all pine plantation. You know, there's still hardwood SMZs and, and creek dranges and, and bottoms. But there's this different age structure of pines, and, you know, it has different, you know, habitat inside of it, depending on, you know, if it's closed canopy or open canopy pines and what kind of ground vegetation there is. Um, When it comes to uh, using some of these terrain uh, features, you know, you kept talking about early on, and you've mentioned a few other times, like a compounding uh, edge uh, or compounding terrain features. Can you kind of go over that a little bit more for us and maybe give us a scenario or two uh, of where you've used that to your advantage on a hunt? Well, it's kind of really hard to explain without using a map. I mean, to, to say it in words is it's kind of really tough. 
uh, like a, a compounded feature. Like you, you have a you have a low point, and it rolls around and it rolls around into a uh, like a bench that wraps up into a high crow's foot. And just above that high crow's foot, you've got a saddle. Uh, so you have several features that are all playing. Like you don't just have a saddle. You don't just have a high crow's foot, which is a thermal hub. You don't just have a bench. You don't just have a, bent, a, a point. You have all these things that are playing on each other, and that creates a dynamic. That creates a, an awesome spot that's almost for sure going to have a buck on it. Uh, a lot of people, they'll, they'll look for a bench, and that's it. They don't mm-hmm. really think about anything else. Or they might look for a thermal hub once they, they now that they know what one is. Uh, and they may look for a point, and yeah, maybe there's a buck bedding on it. They may look for a saddle. You know, but if all these things, you know, you can hunt. I can show you all kinds of benches that do not have trails on them. They're not used at all. There's no bucks bedding on them. There's no scrapes on them. Mm-hmm. But I can also look on a map to one I've never been in my life and point you one that is. It does have a trail on it, and it's going to have be, have be used. It's going to have uh, scrapes on it. It's going to be have old rubs from years on it because it. Everything plays together. It's all a dynamic. It all all plays into one. Got you, Josh. Now, you know, one thing, uh, some, some terminology here I want us to kind of go over for listeners that might not truly understand. Can you go over what a thermal hub is with your description uh, along with a crow's foot? Now, a crow's foot is where several ridges and uh, hollows come down into one point. Uh, now, a low crow's foot, you know, it's way down in the bottom. You know, with, with a bunch of big, big hollows that come into it. A lot of time, what they create is a social hub. It's not, it, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a thermal hub, but it's also a social hub because they connect separate ridge networks. And if you connect several ridge networks, then you're connecting separate deer. I mean, it's kind of like uh, uh, from one county to another county to another county. It's like, like your cities will be on this ridge, and another town will be on this ridge, and another town will be on this ridge. And this big crow's foot in the bottom, which is a which acts as a thermal hub, connects these ridges together. And, all, and you'll have big community scrapes and things of that sort a lot of times in these these large, uh, what I call a social hub, in the bottoms. Now, a thermal hub is way up top. It's, it's up real high. Uh, a lot of times it's created by sediment. You know, there, there's, there's like a hard, a hard sediment you know, in the ground that, you know, they created, you know, in the erosion. There's, there's a high crow's foot way up high. And a lot of times they have uh, uh, benches that are connected to them and points that are connected to them, flat points. And the deer will roll around into those. That's where your bucks will roll around off those benches and points up into a high crow's foot, and they can smell. And that is that is a thermal hub. You know, and your all the scent drops down. Once your thermals reverse, start to fall, they'll drop down off the, all the points there, usually about midway to one-third of a ridge. Got you. That's extremely fascinating. That was way more detailed than I thought you were going to go into, which is awesome. And Andrew totally dismissed that because he just left. Uh, but he's back now. Uh, so, Andrew, we just covered uh, thermal hubs in crow, a crow's foot, which is kind of two different things, which is really, really interesting. Um, now, I got a question for you, you know, Josh. How would you go about, like, if you're hunting, uh, say, you know, you're traveling. I know you said you're living, like, in Nashville, just outside of Nashville now. If you're going to hit up a new piece of public land, you're just kind of scouting for something. Again, kind of coming from a, a different perspective, you know, I know you're very much trying to focus on one specific deer or find specific bucks you're chasing but for a guy like an everyday kind of guy like myself that's just trying to find a decent deer go you know try to go kill some uh, bucks or does whatever the situation is how would you go about you know locating and hunting say like a thermal hub or a crow's foot if that was like kind of what you wanted to get on uh you know during the rut or pre-rut or whatever time frame you think would be good to hunt those areas uh that uh, those thermal hubs that they they operate good all year round if you have all the diversity to go with it, of course, uh, you know, you're going to have to be around, uh, you're going to have to have separate doe groups or uh, deer groups in the area uh, during the rut. Now, outside the rut, you're going to have to have some, you know, it's going to have to be close to a score, uh, which I don't really focus on the thermal hubs much here, you know, outside the rut. I mean, that's that's more of a, that's more of a rut thing uh, because it's covering large, large areas of ground. And, and it's it's relating into scrapes and you know where a buck's gonna gonna travel you know, once he comes off the bed, you know it's not a, a straight bed to feed you know like outside the rut. Gotcha. And so, your social hubs, uh, 
was that more of an early season? Is that what you said kind of at the beginning of the podcast? You like those more early season or? Did... Uh, no, no, that's, that's a, that's a rut thing. That's 100% rut. Okay. And again, just kind of go back over what's the difference in your opinion between a social hub and a thermal hub. Let's, let's hit on that again. A social hub is a, is a, is a, a large area, you know, where several big ridge systems drop way down into a bottom. Uh, a thermal hub is a small crow's foot that's way up on the on the side of a ridge or up one third from the top of the ridge where just your thermals drop down into it off the top of one ridge. So we ask we ask we try to ask everybody this question, but uh, so when you find like this thermal hub and you're pretty confident that there's a deer there, whether you've been getting pictures of them or if you're just going off sign, how do you know exactly where to set up within that area? Like how do you know which tree to get in to kill that deer? And uh, I guess the second part of that question is, how do you deal with the wind in uh, those kind of t- type of areas? Well, the first thing I'll do is we were talking about bumping that deer. Mm-hmm. I will walk out. I don't care if I bump him. I don't care if I walk in his bed or anything. I will, I will extensively scout it, which, you know, I've, I've, I've been doing it long enough that I can pretty much, if there's a deer in the area, I can quickly and easily find where he's bedding at. And I'll find his bed and then I'll find the tree I need to set up on. And then I'll just, I'll just wait for the perfect time. And if, if, I can't find the perfect time before the rut starts that I just won't hunt him at all. But if, if I can, I wait for everything to line up. You know, I wait for the perfect day, day I've got off from work, which is a great day, uh, along with, you know, the wind and everything else, and I'll, I'll slip in and, and try to kill him once I find out where he's at. How do you know what that tree is, uh, w- which tree to kill him out of? Uh, is it just like the, the first tree that he can't see from his bed? You know, I don't, I don't really know, but I'm always right. Hey, that's a, I don't, that's a I don't, good I don't really know. It's it's weird. Yeah, I've I've literally climbed a tree and come back down out of it and set up twenty yards from it and climbed another one and shot a deer and I'd have never shot him if I was in the other tree. Mm-hmm. But I don't I don't really know how that works, but it just does. Well, Josh, that kind of goes over a question that again we try to hit. We're we're trying to ask every single one of our guests this, which uh, Andrew kind of coined the spot in the spot. Which Andrew, would you kind of take over for me? That's what I just asked. Well, you didn't name it. You didn't say that. Oh, well, yeah. yeah Dad gum it, Andrew. <laughs> Jesus. It's the spot in the spot, man. Well, ready to go. Way to go. I'm trying to coin that trying to coin that phrase like well, Donald Well, now, now I have a question here. How, On average, how far are these bucks that you're killing? We're talking, I guess, outside the rut here. Mm-hmm. How far are they making it from their bed before dark uh, when you're killing them or seeing them? Ah, usually anywhere from about 50 to 100 yards. So uh, you know, the specific in. spot, you know, the, the specific spot, you know, of course, the terrain itself, you know, will will dictate, you know, exactly where and, and how far you can set up, you know, on how you enter it. You know, you're, you know, a lot of times your, enter, your entrance itself, you know, dictates, you know, how far you can set up from you. Uh, but, but typically, I would say probably 50 to 100 yards. Now, Josh, I got to ask you this. You know, it seems like you're setting up very close to a buck bed uh, when you're hunting these specific deer. Um, how do you go about setting up your stand quietly? And what is your stand in like stick setups, or are you using a climber? What are you doing to get set up within I, close range of him, but be quiet? I always use a climber. I've, I've used a Summit Open Shot for uh, when they first come out, probably about 17, 18 years ago. And I'm on my second one. I wore my first one out. I'm on my second one now. And I, I really, really enjoy using. It. I mean, and, and it kind of adds to the, it kind of adds to the puzzle because I can only use a tree that I can climb, with my climber. Uh, I can't set up in any I want to, you know, which I would, you know, with like a this, of some sort. And I kind of like having to figure the deer out and having to figure him out with the climber. I, I like, I like that that being limited, you know, to an extent. I mean, kind of like I limit myself with a bow instead of a gun. Gotcha. Now I gotta ask. I mean, do you think you would be more successful if you went to a more uh, versatile system, whether it was a stick and stands oh, yeah. or something? Yes, definitely. Yeah, I would definitely, definitely be a lot, lot easier, you know, and be a lot more effective if I did. Gotcha. Because that that's something that always comes to my mind when we have guys like yourself on, who have history of killing a lot of really good deer and being successful doing it. 
And I mean, you know, I think everybody in this room probably for the most part started out using a climber. Uh, if you, when it came to mobile hunting, because that's like the thing to do in the southeast. You know, it's it's kind of hard in most parts of the south to find a place you can't use a climber uh, when it comes to just basic deer hunting. But um, you know, I'm very fascinated when I hear guys like yourself, especially hunting areas that you've hunted you know, using climbers and being extremely successful and also staying quiet. So I got to ask you, what do you do with your stand? I'm, I'm guessing it's not completely stocked. Uh, what do you do to make your stand kind of quiet so you can get in and out of the woods quietly and climb quietly? What are you doing? It, it's, that, uh, that summit open shot is, is super quiet. There's no moving parts on it. Uh, you know, I've done it so long that I can, I can stick my cables in and out, you know, without it making any noise. I can, I can climb, you know, super quiet with it. I mean, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't make any noise at all. Of course, it's not extremely cold. You know, Kentucky, Tennessee, you know, that's, it's not extremely cold. So you don't have to worry about it, you know, a lot of popping and creaking, things of that sort. You know, it doesn't make any noise uh, moving around on it. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just really, I can, I can literally take it off my back, put it on a tree, and climb 20 feet high in about two minutes. Got you. Now, let's kind of, I want to kind of segue, unless someone else wants to jump in here. I want to segue kind of towards access, okay? I want to know what do you do for access when you have a deer located again because you're a little bit different from you know some guys we've had on you and jeff homan are the only two guys we've ever had on that specifically are targeting individual bucks okay which i find is fascinating because first of all it takes a lot of self-discipline i believe to do that and also takes a lot of heart to be able to go through and find that specific deer to go and chase after uh so that's you know it's, it's fascinating to see that but what are you doing for access to be able to get in and out cleanly? Because you mentioned that earlier about getting in and out cleanly. What are you doing for that? How are you using topography and, and vegetation, everything to your advantage to get to your tree, get up the tree, either kill the deer or get back out cleanly without that deer knowing you were there? Well, I, I'll, I'll sit up on those edges for one thing, which I'm just barely dipping in to what I call the positive train. The areas that he normally uses during daylight. Mm -hmm. in areas that I can use to my advantage. Now, if I'm coming in from the bottom where he's normally at, you know, not at during the day, you know, just at night, you'll see all kind of sign during the bottoms. You know, all your thermals are dropping. You have your edges in the bottom. There's a lot of food sources in the bottom, water's in the bottom. Uh, and then, of course, your open fields. Uh, I enter where I can't hunt and hunt where I can. Therefore, I'm, I'm kind of applying controlled pressure for myself. I'm, I'm pressuring the deer to be where I want him and not be where I don't want him. Got you. Now that brings up a question. Do you ever, or have you ever chased a deer that's using hunter access as his advantage for bedding where you're finding a deer bedding relatively close or right on top of hunter access? Uh, if a deer beds in a certain spot, it's because he gets by with bedding there. I don't think a, a deer, deer don't think logically, you know, he's not, he's not really, he doesn't have hunter access in mind. Uh, if he's bedding in a specific spot, he's there because because that spot doesn't get doesn't get uh, molested very often. It doesn't have people there very often, and a lot of times those spots are right beside parking lots or right beside the road. You know, it's they're right underneath everybody's noses. But the reason he's bedding there is because he doesn't get he doesn't get uh, bumped or uh, uh, interfered with bedding in that location. It's not because he's watching people. Got you. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you. If what you thought they were actually monitoring, uh, you know, when it comes to like you know people coming to and from, um, or if they're just bedding in a place because there's no pressure there, that people are just kind of walking past them. Yes. Yeah. We had a uh, another guy we had on the podcast, uh, Adam Jolly from North Carolina. Uh, he killed a freaking giant uh, thirteen point this year in North Carolina, uh, opening weekend of the season up there. That was what he thought was bedded in a spot where he was overlooking a parking lot. And uh, the only way for him to hunt it was they, they actually slept in their truck the night before. They got there the night before uh, in the parking lot because the deer was there. And What he kind of come to understand was, and he's had this happen with a few deer, was in that real mountain country of uh, western North Carolina, uh, you know, the deer would bed on a ridge top looking down, you know, over, you know, a, a uh, you know, a valley drainage, which a lot of times would have a, uh, you know, parking lot there. 
And if you came in in the mornings, in his opinion, you come in in the mornings, unless you got there super, super, super early, uh, you know, you'd go in there and that deer wouldn't show back up to his bed. But if you slept there the night before in the vehicle, uh, he could hike in fairly early in the morning and have that deer come back to bed and, and shoot it in his bed. And he did that this year, which is kind of interesting, but it's not overly relatable because of the terrain and topography and everything that we live in and hunt in, uh, kind of down here in the deep south. Uh, so I was just curious to see if you've ever seen that before in Kentucky uh, with those kind of deer bedding real close to those parking lots um, and, uh, you know, how that kind of works. Because I think a lot of guys really do walk past stuff like that. I saw a spot up in uh, very – I mean, as northern Missouri as you could have gone before you hit Iowa. I actually slept in Iowa and uh, scouted in Missouri. is a mile from there. And uh, the best spot on that property I found was within 100 yards of that parking lot. And it was behind a wall of freaking knockout rose bushes that would tear up jeans uh, and everything. And you push through there, and freaking the deer sign was unbelievable, and the buck sign was unbelievable in, the, in that area, along with beds and everything else like that. So, I don't. It's something that's just kind of fascinating because I think a lot of guys. Uh, we've had a guy on in the past who uh, talked about, you know, not many people when they leave the truck are automatically thinking about like hunting. Like hunting's on their mind. They're thinking about getting to their spot. They're not thinking about hunting right then and there. Uh, so you can have a lot of deer there that a lot of guys walk past. So this is something I want to kind of touch on. Um, as far as, uh, like the moon phase and, and stuff like that, do you have any opinions or thoughts on that? Yeah, yes, they're, they're definitely moon, uh, overhead. They're going to move a lot more, especially in the mornings and the evenings. Like your last, your first three hours, of the morning, I've definitely seen a, a major spike in movement. And I actually went over years and years of trail cam footage that I had, I had saved and then went back and checked the, the, the lunar uh, position. And there's definitely, definitely a lot more movement when the, when the moon's straight overhead. I haven't really noticed that much moon underfoot, you know, moon rise, moon set, but definitely when the moon's overhead. So outside of that, have you picked up any, uh, anything else from your uh, trail cams? Have you noticed anything? Um, one thing that I've been thinking about here lately is uh, like a front, when a front pushes through, how it almost resets and the deer move at a different time, like almost uh, 12 hours uh, from when the front finished up, you know, they'll feed, you know, real heavy about that length of time from from when that front pushed through. Have you noticed any, any you know, anything unusual or, or something that most people wouldn't think about? Uh, well, I'm not sure about unusual or what, you know, most people would think about, but, uh, especially where I'm at, you know, Kentucky up here, uh, when a, a cold front moves in, you know, they're calling for snow, December, January, February, there will be a major feeding frenzy. You'll go by farm fields and different things like that. And there may be 40, 50 deer in this field. You go two or three miles up, there'll be 20, 30 deer in this field, another 20 miles up, there'll be 20, 30 deer in this, this field. That's, you know, there, there's definitely a, a major feeding frenzy when I, when I, uh, a big cold front's coming in up, up here outside of the uh cold fronts have you noticed anything like that really enhances movement uh not not really you know the the rut uh moon straight overhead uh and and pressure can be weird sometimes pressure can can cause movement and sometimes it can cause the deer to hang the, the hunker down it's uh, i guess it depends on the the deer themselves okay so we got we got talking hunting pressure uh, do you, th I just like to ask everybody this because sometimes I say yes, sometimes I say no. Uh, when you're hunting a specific deer, um, is there, is hunting pressure ever in the back of your mind as in something that's affecting deer movement in the area that you're hunting? Uh, yes, to an extent. Uh, I don't know if somebody's been in there and bumped that. A lot of times I don't know if somebody has been in there the day before and that messes with my mind. Uh, because you can bump a deer out of an area and he may not come back for a day or two. It's hard to, it's, it's really, really hard to make a deer leave an area permanently. I mean, you've got to, especially a mature buck, you've got to do a lot to push a deer, push a buck completely out of an area and him not come back. Uh, he may change how he's using it. He may use it more nocturnally. Of course, deer are nocturnal by nature anyway, but, but it, it is. And I, I'll get really aggressive finding him find out exactly where he's at and how he's using the area and then i'll back out and then i get super aggressive again whenever i want to kill him i mean i'll go right in on top of him gotcha so 
you know, let's let's talk about that. Kind of walk us. I want you. I want you to really walk us through maybe a memorable hunt you've had where you've done that, where you've you've located that buck, you came in, you bumped him, or you knew exactly where he was at. You waited for those right conditions, and you got very aggressive and went right back in on top of him. And kind of, can you break down maybe a hunt like that and really show us, you know, from the time you bumped him to the like the, the perfect conditions for you to go back in there. You know, what did that aggressive uh, behavior for what you were looking for to get in there on him, what were what did that look like, and how would someone go about doing that? Man, it's 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 not – I mean, I, I, hate, I hate to say it like this, and I hate to do this, but but it's not – it's not that it's really that complicated. It's super simple. If he's on a summer pattern or a winter pattern, you know, bed to feed, uh, is all I have to have is the right wind a day off in the right wind. And those are pretty much the perfect conditions. Mm -hmm. And I can slip in there and slip in there and kill him. But that, that's what I need. It's the right wind and a day off work. And so, I'll, I'll go in, I'll go in right on top of him and try to kill him. So for the right wind, are you, are you talking about the right wind for you to access or the right wind for, for his bedding or what, what does that kind of look like? I'm, I'm talking about the right wind for my, for my, for my use. For my advantage, I don't really care what the wind's doing for him, because okay. uh, ninety percent of the time a mature buck's just bedding where he's going to bed anyway, regardless okay. of what the wind's doing. So and I need the wind to be in my favor. So is, is that going to be like a high wind day, or you know, is it is wind speed you know a, a factor in that, or mm -hmm. or is it something else? Just wind direction. Uh, wind direction, uh, but I don't uh, anything where I'm at, and I, I know deer are different all over the place. Where I'm at, if the wind gets over about about 12 mile an hour, I don't hardly see any deer at all. And a dead calm to, to a medium light wind, you know, up to about six seven mile an hour is like perfect. Anything beyond that, I don't hardly, I don't, you know, you, you get you get up over like like 12 mile an hour winds, you won't hardly see nothing where I'm at. And during the rut, you'll see some deer, but outside the rut, you won't see nothing. Okay, well, again, um, you know, you, you talk about like you know being relatively simple. You know, I'm, I'm glad that's the case because, you know, there's a lot of listeners that listen to this show that are, come from a bunch of different backgrounds. There's some guys that listen to the show that are I mean, extremely uh, seasoned deer killers, public land deer killers. And there's other guys that are I mean, extremely brand new. We know we had a guy that was a listener success story that sent us a message. Uh, he just got back into deer hunting after 20 years of not hunting. And, and he and, killed a stud. Yeah, he killed a great public land north uh, Georgia buck after getting back into it. That's so awesome. Man. And um, so awesome. you know the the whole thing is you know no matter how complex or simple something is that we talk about on the podcast, I, I like for everybody to explain it. I, I like for you to explain it. No matter how complex or simple it is, just because there's somebody out there, I promise you, that's listening to this that is so fired up because he's like, I can do this. I can go and try this, and it clicks with them. Every episode we have on the podcast, we always have a listener that normally messages us, be like, Hey, this worked for me. And, you know, sometimes I think of it, I'm like, Man, this, you know, whoever we have on, like, maybe this tactic won't work for me, but there's somebody out there that's listening right now that's like, I can do this. Okay. Get me fired up, son. Yeah, exactly. And Michael Pike's over here is like, Dude, I'm going to do it in the morning. I'm going to yeah. kill a big one. <laughs> I feel like I've been, I feel like I've been paying much, too much attention to what the deer is is thinking he should be doing <laughs> yeah <laughs> instead yeah. of what i should be doing about my own self yeah it's like don't think for the deer think for yourself yeah uh which is something josh i think you really touched on quite a bit today is you know don't worry necessarily about what that deer is going to do because he's going to do what he's going to do okay but figure out what's yeah. going to work for you to get in there to go kill him um or at least get eyes on him again and kind of figure out okay what's my next move if you can't kill him that first time going in there what's my next move after that um, now, Josh, do you have a situation like that where you've gone in, went real aggressive, and it didn't work for you, but maybe you got eyes on the deer and you made a second or third move later on that made you, you know, kind of, you know, you know, take the deer home with you, you know, right, right in the back of the truck? Uh, yes, I've adjusted. You know, you have to – I've seen deer and then have to adjust and kill him the very next time or not seeing him at all and then, and then set up in a completely different spot within a score, you know, and kill him the very next time. Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, – where a deer is not tells you just about as much information as where a deer is. Uh, like you can use five five trail cameras. Used to, I would put a trail camera out, and I let that trail camera set week after week after week, hoping that a buck would find my trail camera mm -hmm. instead of moving my trail cameras around finding a buck. Boom. That was awesome. Yep. That, that, that quote right there is good enough, dude. I, I'm happy just for that one quote. <laughs> yeah, dude, move that truck camera around. That's that's a really freaking good point, man. So many guys are like, man, I don't have a deer on camera. I ain't, 
you know, they got either on private, well, especially private land, you know, they're throwing corn out if it's legal or whatever. And man, there ain't no deer coming my my, my freaking my my camera. Freaking move it, dude, or on, on public land, move it. Yep. Um, so that's a really really good point, Josh. That I think a lot of guys is overlook is yeah, dude, stay mobile. Like, don't just stay mobile with your tree stand set. Stay mobile with your cameras. Stay mobile with your scouting. Just stay mobile constantly and figure out where that deer is at. Now, Josh, another thing I got to ask you: How often? What what does the core area shift look like, if anything, from early season to late season for you? Like, have you been like kind of tracking some deer that early season they were in one area and then late season they were totally different, or were they in the same kind of area? And let, let's talk. Let's kind of get away from like the farm country stuff. Let's talk like maybe big woods or like you know something where there's not so much ag. Is there much of a shift from what you've seen for early season core areas to late season? Yes, there's there's usually quite a bit of a shift, uh, especially where I'm at. Uh, they'll feed in a, a lot of your bottom, your bottom growth. Of what uh, I call it aquatic growth. Mm-hmm. A lot of stuff that grows in the bottoms during the summer. You know, when you when you, you know, have a lot of rain, even even when it's dry, you know, a lot of stuff grows down in the bottoms uh, that the deer will feed on. And then, of course, during the winter, where I'm at, you know, they they mainly feed up in the clear cut. You know, they're hitting honeysuckle, uh, woody browse, you know, high carb stuff. You know, so they can, you know, so the deer can stay warm. Gotcha. Yes, they're, they're two totally, totally different spots, but the core may be fairly close to each other. I mean, uh, uh, where a deer, where, where a buck's core normally is, could be, uh, you know, right in the exact same area. Like the buck that I killed uh, last year, you know, he would, he would use that spot su- uh, winter or summer, either one. Uh, but some areas, you know, a buck may have to go uh, two or three miles, uh, you know, from a, a, a summer core to a winter core. You know, depending on you know if if it's farm country, maybe it's farm country. There's a whole bunch of bunch of bottoms. Uh, you know, and he's down here, and and there may be a, a spot up on the ridges three miles away that's a much better spot during the winter. And he may you know that his core may shift all the way over there after the rut. Got you. Now, so a question I've got to ask you then is, how do you go about it? Say so like. You know, there's a lot of our listener group. You know, we got again listeners across the country, and a lot of the guys, if there's you know their season is still in, it's in their late season. You know, it's post rut. You know, we're looking, uh, you know, very late into the season. Even some states probably coming to the end of their season. Um, you know, what what are you doing tactics wise for late season, especially like maybe in Kentucky, if you didn't have you know your buck already on the ground, and it's late season. You know, getting close to January. Um, you know, what are you doing at that time frame to try to find those bucks? I mean, you're trying to find the biggest, baddest food source on the property, uh, especially if we're talking public land here, or, or what are you going about doing to try to locate those deer in late season? Yes, I will try to find, I will try to find the best food source uh, where all the does are at. The does, the does leave all kinds of sign. I mean, they, they leave heavy sign as far as browse, uh, trails, tracks, uh, scat, and if you can find the does, then you'll find the best food source in the area. Now, if you can find an isolated food source, which is exactly the same, but in less abundance, which is fairly easy to do, then you're probably going to find a mature buck somewhere. All right. What was the isolated food source for you? What does that look like in the region of the country you're hunting? Uh, let's say they're, they're feeding, like, you know, where a, a cut corn, you know, it's a cut corn field. Uh, and, of course, the combines nowadays, they don't, they, don't, they don't leave much anymore. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of growth in there, and your does are hitting that. Now, maybe in a back corner somewhere, you know, a buck may be using all those edges, and there's some diversity connected to it. Or maybe it's a honeysuckle thicket, and the does are hitting it real hard or some kudzu. And, you know, there, there may be an isolated spot somewhere else. But if you can find out what the does are keying in on, then you can find out what a mature buck is keying on as well. And a lot of times he's – I mean, he may be with the does or at a different time or kind of separate himself to an extent – or he may be keying on the exact same food source, but just in a different spot. Got you. Now, a question, you just said something that I, I want to kind of get your opinion on. Are you seeing deer uh, feed on kudzu late in the season when it's completely dead and dried out? Where I'm at, yes, they, they'll, they'll, feed, they'll hit on it some. Now, once it turns brown, not not so much. Gotcha. But they'll still hit on it, hit on it, you know, some, just like, you know, like a fescues and things like that, they'll still get. Got you, man. Okay. I was gonna say there's a spot on some public land that that we hunt that's uh, a ton of kudzu and man I saw so many freaking does there early season and to be honest I wanted to try to find out how to kill them but uh, it would have been I would need some rock climbing gear to go get to them um, but anyways I was just wondering kind of late season food source if you've seen those deer feeding on anything like that 
Uh, well, well, Josh, you know, let me ask you this, and I think we'll kind of wrap up, you know, the three of us here, uh, me, Andrew, and uh, Mike, uh, to ask you just a couple questions to kind of wrap this up. You know, one thing I want to ask you is, you know, you know, I think there's a lot of takeaways from this episode, from everything we've covered, from the different edges, you know, how to hunt edges, how to use edges to your advantage, uh, you know, how to use access to your advantage, how to use the wind to your advantage. Really, oh, there's a lot of different takeaways from this episode, but what is like one of the biggest pieces of advice that you would give to somebody, you know, one of our listeners to us uh, to kind of go out there and start implementing some of these tactics on their own local pieces of public land at this time of the season? Like, what would you tell us, like, tell me to do, you know, tomorrow, hey, Jay, we need to start doing this if I wanted to kind of go out and maybe try to locate some bucks in some core areas? Well, what I've, the biggest thing and what I've keyed in on here recently, uh, you know, the last, I'd say, five, six years, is I had areas that were bucks cores year after year. Uh it may skip a year, and it, you'd be from one buck to another buck. And for a long time, I couldn't figure out why this buck would choose this spot as a score, or this buck would choose the same spot as a score. Why would buck after bucks choose the exact same spot as their core areas? And then it hit me that these bucks weren't choosing the same spot as their core, that the core area was actually a manifestation of essential needs. It was the variety, the diversity, the security, the water, that all the, like the environment itself created the core and drew the buck and held him. He has no idea what a core even is. Now, a buck does not have a clue what a core area is. And whenever I removed the buck making a choice of finding a core for himself, which left all kind of mystery, why would he do that? And I added that they're not choosing anything, that the environment itself creates the core, that a buck doesn't even know what a core is, then that removed all the mystery and it added predictability. Now I can find cores in areas that I've never been to in my life by looking for the variety and the diversity and the security and the isolation and the water. I just use my, I put my cameras into those areas. I find a buck I want to kill. I go in, I scout it real hard. I go in, I kill it. And that's why I'm not killing 150s each year. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, Mike, you got a kind of a follow-up? Is, is there anything that you think uh, isn't really discussed a lot by, you know, podcast or, you know, YouTube or any of your main forums that you feel like uh, needs to, you know, be put out there? Uh, probably one thing that, that, you know, like like we were discussing earlier about, about what a deer does, you know, what he's choosing or what he's thinking. Uh, is something that, that I think is a big mistake that a lot of people make. You know, the, the deer, deer, deer don't operate, you know, they don't consciously make decisions. You know, they subconsciously react. And I think that's a huge mistake that, that and, and you can almost read everything you've ever read or been told or seen or heard. You can take that and relate it to deer don't consciously react. They subconsciously react. And then apply that to it. Rethink it. Rethink everything you've ever read and heard and apply that logic. And it'll it, 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 it completely twist it around and make a lot more sense and make hunting a whole lot easier. That wraps up this week's episode, kind of. we got a whole big, long outro. Uh, Jacob is just about to burst at the seams over there. What are you doing, Jacob? <laughs> excitement, man. It's excitement. Because I know somebody's going to use these tactics from this podcast to go kill a buck. It might not be us, but it's going to be somebody listening. <laughs> no, it's going to be us. All right. Well, it might not be you. I don't know. I'm going to kill one on your wedding day. Oh, so the plan. Listen, <laughs> Andrew's getting married. The, listen, Andrew's getting married. Okay, we're recording this on a Thursday. Yeah. Andrew's getting married this weekend. So, unfortunately, by the time this episode comes out, he's not going to be a bachelor no more. Unfortunately. Sorry, ladies. Sad for me. <laughs> it's not too late. We can all go on a hunting trip. <laughs> hey, we can make him single. Oh, dude, I was going to go in the morning for sure. I was going to go. I was actually thinking about going to do uh, well, I'm about go? to go down a rabbit hole well, here. Was gonna go? I was gonna go. I was gonna go try and shoot a duck because I'm like hell bent on killing a duck now. Just do it, man. Call him to work. No, I'll t- I tell him like tell him get some more stomach issues. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob's been playing hooky. Anyways, what were we talking? No, about? hold on. Listen, you, you yeah, derailed. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, right. whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. When listen. did you have stomach issues? Don't worry about it. This week. You been hunting? No, I did unfortunately. I really did feel like crap, so. Quite literally. Did you hunt today? 
No. Okay. No, no. But right. no, I went and got picked up my uh, tux for Andrew's freaking wedding, which, listen, Andrew's wedding Saturday, all right, at like 4 p.m., whatever the hell it is. I'm hunting that morning. I'm killing a buck, and I'm taking it completely out whole to his wedding. I was about to say, if you don't bring it to the wedding, is, I, would, I would never I'm, forgive I'm you. packing it full. I'm like strapping it on top. I'm driving straight to the <laughs> wedding, okay, changing into the tux. And we're taking, we're taking some trophy picks of us at the wedding with him and his tux and me and my tux with the freaking deer. Dude. It's going to be freaking B.A. Dude. Legendary. Sounds Tiffany's good. gonna hate me forever. Nah, she'll love it. No, she won't. No, she won't. <laughs> <laughs> take your take her your broken heart oh. and and tell her to piece it back together. <laughs> All right. We got we got a lot to go over here. We got a lot to go over. Uh, what, what are we hit first? <laughs> All right. Uh well I'll say first thing, a lot of people seem like they really enjoy the podcast we dropped from this past week, talking about kind of tail two hunts. You know, yeah, you use, I was surprised at that. You use some tactics that I didn't use. I didn't see crap, and you killed a buck, and I got <laughs> speared by a freaking falling branch. So yeah, oh yeah. What's hunts. that looking like now? Oh, uh, it's still looking rough. Uh, this is the first time I've seen oh, it. Oh, he's about to. Oh <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's dry. Oh, it's green. It hurts. Purple. Oh, it's not green, but it's purple. For <laughs> no, sure. it's green. Yeah, it's, it's all green. different kind of colors. It's green. It's, it's the rainbow. It's like it's like if uh. You got green, like like yellow, green in the rainbow. Yeah. So to see so to give you guys an, an idea of what this looks like, it looks like it's probably even bigger than a softball. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, this is nasty. It looks like it, a three year old yeah. took a bunch of like he got he got <laughs> like a, yeah he markers. Got, he got a handful just, of all the most repulsive colors and yeah. markers and, and like just started scribbled. Drawing. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty gross. Yeah. It hurts. Yeah. It does. That'll teach you. That's what she said. <laughs> That hurts. Not that I'll teach you. <laughs> <laughs> no God. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. Let's open another beer. All right. So should we uh, drink another? Drink another. <laughs> so I'm trying to, so I can keep up with this conversation. All right. So what should we what, what should we talk about first? What do you mean? What should we talk about? Man, okay. We'll talk Mike about, just killed a buck. What are you talking about? Yeah. We'll save the best for last. Okay. All right. We'll talk. We'll talk about my thing because I did it first. Oh um, yes. So this morning was interesting. Okay. What it, what was the plan going into this morning? All right. We were going. Who's we? Mark Turner okay. from Hunt the Land and one of his buddies. Uh, and we met up and we drove down to a WMA and uh, we were going to go shoot some wood ducks. And I've never been duck hunting before. So I took out my uh, my Mossberg shotgun with my, <laughs> with my Indian Creek joke. <laughs> <laughs> it's all I had. And they were like, you want to go in the morning? I was like, yeah, I hope this works. So I went down there. Um, it was pretty good. I mean, we got on this pond, and I mean, dude, we could have easily had a three man limit, but we just all suck at shooting. Oh, really? We all, yeah, we all missed. We killed one right at the break of dawn. What question? The all decoys or calls? Like, what was the what was Both. the tactics going into it? Mark hunted this last week, and they killed a three man limit last week. But a lot of the ducks were landing in this one area of the pond, which is where we set up, and so we put like a jerk rig out there. I think that's what it's called. And we, so yeah, we had decoys and we had calls and we had all kinds of birds dropping into the decoy spread or they weren't dropping into the spread. They were dropping like 50 yards out in the pond for some reason. We just couldn't get them to come closer. Uh, so, and we got buzzed a few times, but uh, it was just like pretty, un, like not uneventful, but I mean, these birds are coming in like for right at dawn. Well, there's a speaker upstairs. Just went off. <laughs> we all stopped at the same time. Anyways, these birds came in like right at gray light, and you could see them on the skyline. And it was like it was legal light. It was 30 minutes before sunrise, but they'd get below the tree line, and you could not see them. And then all of a sudden, you'd see like a splash on the water, and they're sitting there in front of you. Uh, and so uh, it was pretty good that morning, like early. And then it got light, and we sent the dog out there, and he went and got the duck. And then there's some other ducks on the other end of the pond. It's like a 10-acre pond. And we're like, all right, let's go jump shoot those. And so we start sneaking down there. And I have a turkey choke. So they're like, you go down there and jump shoot them because you have a choke and you can reach out there and touch them. Uh, so I go down there. And I get to the edge of the pond and I'm looking at these ducks. And I'm like, they're like 100 yards away. I can't kill these things. <laughs> Break the apex number nine and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I, had some, I had some tongues and I could probably kill them. But I'm standing there and I look to my right and here comes like 15 ducks. Just like, dude, there's like a whole damn swarm of them coming straight towards us. And 
we all miss them a bunch of times. And then some more come by, and I shoot one of them and don't kill it. And then Mark shoots one and kills it. It was it was it was terrible. Like well, no, it was actually like extremely fun. Our shooting was terrible, but it was a really good time. Uh, so we we went away with two wood ducks, and we're walking out, and we're walking through this cutover, and there's these little thick draws going through the cutover, and we hear something when we look over, and here's this dang pig like running around in the bottom of this cutover, like rooting around just in the brush. And we all like stand there for a second, and then I like I load up and I start stalking down towards it. Which what's the load we're you using? Uh, steel shot number twos, sweet three inch. So I'm like I got to get approximately ten yards from this thing and shoot it in the ear hole to kill it, probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's what I tried to do. So I started out at like sixty yards, stalk down towards it a little bit. Uh, I can't remember exactly what happened, but they they got in the open and I shot at them. Did not kill it. Um, it didn't even squeal or anything. I don't even know if maybe I missed it or something. I don't. I don't really know what happened. But the so there's like three or four like bigger pigs, and they run off, and so they they run off out in the cutover, and then but like in the in the draw in the brush, I could still hear like squealing and snorting and all kinds of stuff. So I get down there and I start like ninja crawling through these briars and like ducking and bobbing and weaving through this stuff. And I see all these little piglets run by, and I'm like, oh, my God. Like, I guess my only guess is that the bigger pigs got separated from them, and the little piglets didn't know what to do. And these are, like, young pigs. And, uh, yeah, we killed all four of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah so, so there was one without a head. What was the story with that? Like, the clean cut one? I guess. So, yeah, I mean, it was like rabbit hunting them because, I mean, there's just four little piglets out there. And they just trap them, like, extensively on this WMA, but they don't – I mean, once you – there's so many down there now that they're having a really hard time with them. So I'm glad we could take a dent in the population, I guess, uh, even though it was just four. But So I, I, we were, like, determined to not let any of these things get away because we're, like, <laughs> we're right on them. So they, they start walking by in, like, a line, and they start running through, and I kill the first one. And I rack a new shell in, and they start getting away. And they run, and then I just hear them stop. I'm like, they stopped in a brush pile or something. So I walk up there and get the first one, and I'm carrying it out. And then I walk up, and I step on this brush pile, and they'll sh- they'll shoot out of it. <laughs> and I kill another one of them. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then the two other ones run off, and then Mark's buddy killed both of those. What a killer. Dude, we, ki- we killed every one of them. And they're like little piglets. They're like swamp rabbits. Dude, they're, they're not even the size, of a, the size of a swamp rabbit. Yeah, I was going to say, they are itty bitty little things. And we quartered them out. And, uh, you quartered them? Well, no, we can't. We, <laughs> well, no, we can't. We, like, we get some, get some freaking like little drumsticks coming off. Them. Yeah, I brought my kafaru. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we carried them out whole, and then at the truck we like quartered them. <laughs> like, dude, you talk about the the definition of a pocket animal. Dude, you they were so little. Slip in your back pocket, just walk out. I shot a sow uh, years ago, and um, that was in the uh, afternoon. I went back the next day to hunt. Uh, it was deer hunting. And um, those things were still squealing and around its mom, like, crying. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> man, it was pretty rough. We just set that mood for us. So, all right, yeah. man. We went from killing them all yeah. to freaking leave them all to <laughs> die. Them. They're all starving, <laughs> crying. Coyotes picking them off <laughs> one by one. It's like a horror movie. Freaking bald eagle. We were talking out. about that. We're like, man, if I was a coyote, I would eat these. They're slow. They're not very smart. They're like. They look delicious. To be I can't wait to eat these things. Well, how, so how, like they're truly crockpot size. I mean, they're like you could put them in a crockpot. Like, put some potatoes in there, some carrots, some they're, celery, they're, and just drop it they're in there. Small. You could grill them whole. Did you gut them? Did you just gut them and leave them whole? No, I straight up, I quartered them. You quartered them? Yeah, I straight up quartered them. I tr- I started to leave them whole, but like you can't you can't skin them like a squirrel. Like you can't just pull the hide off of it because it's like a it's a pig and it's like got real thick hide on it. <laughs> and uh. So, and really, they were too small to, like, hang up or anything. Because, I mean, literally, they're the size of, like, a cottontail rabbit. So, yeah, I just split them down the back and took the quarters and everything. And, I mean, like, the, man, they were pitiful. The uh, the back straps were like a piece of jerky. I mean, they were little bitty. Man. But, yeah, I wish I could have got mama, but I'm happy with those. I, I Dude, I cannot wait to eat that thing. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> So. Like, like, add some, put some butter on it, some olive oil, put it in a cast iron pan for a little bit, 
Oh man. Oh, dude. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a good. It was a good morning. That's the first time I've went out and duck hunted with a dog and decoys and calls and everything ever. So killed two ducks and uh, four pigs. It was a pretty good morning. Piglets. 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 Little youngins. All right. Cool. All right. Listen. All right. Now let's hear the cool story. I'm trying to think if I have anything to add to this. Nothing really. No. I'm just here for commentating. Except you, you got the bubble guts and almost killed oh. a doe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, pun intended. Yeah, it was bad, dude. It was real bad. Oh, I, I did have that run in with a freaking, I don't know, that one doe and fawn right off the pump station. But that was anything really to write home about. It scared the crap out of me. Freaking about to walk off, go down this drainage and go hike up to kind of where you shot that deer and freaking there's a doe standing right there. I'm like, oh, hello. Knock an arrow. Get down my knee. I might come up a little bit close. She's like 55 yards, and she did not get close enough. So, bummer. Yeah. Yep. But, man, the man himself, Michael, Michael just Pike. killed a buck. Michael just killed a buck off the ground. Yeah, so so basically uh, we got a gun hunt coming up. And really, I mean, whoa, it's just. Whoa, whoa, yeah. Listen. Oh, my God. I got to give people some backstory. No. Oh. All right, that was a bleep. The bleep? He didn't cuss. He said the name of the park. Jesus, Michael. Well, you, you should learn this. We've had you on enough. So, <laughs> I know, and you know enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, can I say that there's a gun hunt? Yeah, sure, that's fine. Yeah, All right. say everything except the name. All if right, people so want to try that hard to figure it out, then so be it. <sighs> yeah. So, there's a gun hunt coming up, and I was uh, going to do some scouting because this particular management area... <laughs> <laughs> is uh new to me i, I don't I, I mean this is really gonna be the first year to really give it a good shot so um uh, anyways so um i went out scouting and uh took my bow i actually ended up leaving the uh, camcorder in the truck and uh, that way i could focus just on you know doing the scouting so i take off through this area where i thought it'd be a good spot um and uh, get almost all the way to where I was going, and this area just looks good, and I'm sitting here looking around, and I hear something off in the woods. I'm like, hmm, hmm. sounds like a deer. <laughs> so uh, I listen a little bit longer, and it's, you know, still sounds like a deer, and I'm like, huh. So I uh, ease on, like, I got the wind. It's it's kind of parallel in uh, whatever animal this is off in the woods. So I'm in, like, a, a pine thicket. Oh, it's, they try to replant, replant pines, and some of it's thick, and some of it's, you know, kind of sporadic. Um, but I've got this five-yard strip of uh, pines that are about, I don't know, six, seven foot tall that are separating me and whatever's making this noise. So I ease on over, and I try to find a shooting lane. And I'm sitting here for a couple of minutes, and I, it, it sounds like it's right on top of me. And uh, I still can't see where it's at. I'm thinking it's down here. It sounds like it's down here in this little creek uh, right next to me. And uh, so I'm looking through these pines to the, like the bottom, and I'm trying to make it out, and I can't see anything moving. Minutes minutes go by, and then all of a sudden I'm like, I look up, and so this is right on the edge of a hill. The hill goes up, well, 15 yards further than where the sound, you know, sounded like it was coming from was a buck. And he's just sitting there, and he's, like, feeding on the edge of this thicket. And I'm like, holy, holy crap, that's a buck. It's not a doe. I, th I thought it was going to be a doe. It just sounded, you know, like real quiet and dainty. And so I'm sitting there expecting a doe. And then all I see is, like, rack and points. And I'm like, oh, shooter. So, <laughs> like, I'm on the ground with my bow, and I'm, like, 25 yards away. And uh, about the time I'm like, oh, shooter, I don't know if I must have, you know, I don't know, telepathy or something, but that buck turned and looked at me, and I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even draw my bow yet. So I draw my bow back, and I was like, instantly, I was like, oh, 30 yard pin, boom. About that time, about the time of the dunk, that deer turns his head, and like, it, he's basically heading back towards where he just came from. And. The arrow disappears. I don't know if it hit the deer. The deer takes off. The deer is crashing through all this thick stuff because there's blowdowns. There's, I mean, vines everywhere. This is some thick, nasty crap. And then there's the creek. And all of a sudden, he gets about, I don't know, 100 yards away. 
and all of a sudden it goes quiet and I'm like oh I just killed that buck and uh, I was like he's a good buck well so then I get to look and I, I, I go up a little bit higher in elevation and use my binoculars to look through the woods and then I notice that it opens up and there's grass and I was like oh man I was like he just hit that grass and that's why I couldn't hear him anymore and he took off and I missed him and I'm looking for my arrow I don't see it through my binoculars and I've got lighted knocks I go over there and I I look at the initial spot and uh, I didn't I didn't find any blood and so then I you know start heading off in the direction he went and I get about 15 yards and there's blood and there's blood everywhere and there's blood everywhere for a hundred yards. This I mean, blood it looked, is ridiculous. Well, you I seen mean, it? oh yeah. Oh, I want to see this. Yeah, my phone's dead. <laughs> oh, dude, it, yeah. it is ridiculous. Yeah, okay. I mean, it and no it lie, it's a solid red line <laughs> going no, to the deer. No lie, sweat. Yeah, like you don't even have to look down at the ground. You can just use it, you know, your peripheral view, and just walk straight, and you can just see blood like everywhere. I mean, like, yeah. there, was, there was a couple of spots where it looked like the deer laid down, flopped and rolled around, and just covered, like, I mean, like, Everything. A, like a, a cubic yard on both sides. Oh, wow. Like, just total blood. So, I get down there, too, and I'm like, I'm pumped, because this, this is a big buck, quotation marks, all right? I get down there, too, and, and I'm like, I'm pumped. I you know, I was videoing the whole thing, and I get down there, and I'm like, I look at him, and I can see his rack sticking up, and I was like, four points. I'm like, oh, yeah. I was like, this is you know, going to be a nice one. I get down there to him, and I'll, I'll pick up his rack, and I'll be damned. <laughs> <laughs> four points on one side and one on the other. This buck has one long, like, main beam. Main beam. It's like ten or twelve inches long, and doesn't have doesn't have any more points to match on that side. Mm. Oh my god, I was so freaking ticked off right <laughs> there! <laughs> I mean, ticked off. Hey man, but it was on the ground buck. Yeah, on the ground buck. Um, That's a pretty twenty five yards. Yeah. Heck yeah. So in Alabama, I mean, you can't expect much more than a goofy racked buck. <laughs> 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 but anyways, yeah, it was pretty cool. And then uh, I had the drag out. I know I was talking to Jacob quite a bit. I figured you was in class or something um, uh, since you wasn't responding to the text messages. But anyways, I I go down there, and I'm trying to figure it out. I, I do finally get a hold of you. Yeah. And, um, and you told me an easier way to get this buck out. I didn't know we could use that road. But anyways, I go down there, and I'm having to uh, try to figure out how to get this buck out by myself. I have two really, really steep hillsides and then a pond in between me and this road. So I was like, I can't get it up either of these hillsides and go around the pond. So I ended up having to roll my uh, car hearts up. I actually wore my car hearts out there too. Like I didn't even have my camo on. Um, and so I rolled my car hearts up, took my shoes off, took my uh, socks off, and waded through the water. And you know how cold it is. We was talking about how cold it was. It was like 40... 40 degrees, but it felt like it was in the 30s, and I had to get in that water and drag the deer through the water to make it a little bit easier and go around the edge and, and then back over there. So it was pretty interesting, but... That sounds yeah. miserable. Yeah. So the weirdest thing about this is where you hit this buck. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, have we got, have y'all looked at it like Oh yeah. In more in depth. Okay, what's you haven't seen all right, it yet? All right, all right. I mean, not really. Dude, yeah, weird. I was getting to that, and I got totally sidetracked. So anyways... This is one of the weirdest. Yeah. This is the weirdest so, archery shot I've ever yeah. seen. So all of this blood, and like I was saying, when I drew back, he, he saw me before I drew back. And when I released, he was already turning his head around to head back the direction he just came. When he did, he did it, you know, so quick, that arrow hit him <laughs> right through the freaking cheekbone, dude. I mean, like, right under his right eye. Yeah. Through the cheekbone. We don't know where the arrow that came arrow out That arrow is in his neck. He I'm, thinks I'm it's almost in pretty sure. He thinks oh, it's really? still in the neck. I'm almost 100% dude, let's sure. Let's go open it here right now. I'm serious. <laughs> no, no, okay, okay. So, like, so, dude, this deer, the way that it swung around, 
Like, and the but. way he released and everything. So, I mean, dude, weird stuff happens sometimes. It's just archery. Like, you, you, you try, like, you know, it's just, eventually it's going to happen when you kill enough deer with a bow. Something strange is going to happen. This is the weirdest thing I've ever seen, dude. This deer, literally, like an inch below his eye, half an inch below his eye, the arrow goes in. There's no exit. Okay, when you lift up his head and twist it, his his head his neck bends except for like this much of the middle like six inches oh. in the middle and it's like straight I'm like that arrow is 100 percent in that dude deer's let's neck. open that I'm serious let's open it up tonight dude autopsy. that deer that deer swung his head around here's what yeah. I think happened I'm calling it right now because we haven't opened it I think that he turned and it hit him below the eye and it freaking channeled down his like spine and got lodged in his neck and it's somewhere the end of the arrow is probably somewhere just right up in his chest cavity. And you cut something important because he, uh, my God, did he believe? I mean, it was ridiculous. I mean, it like we thought it had to be like a carotid artery or something, but I have no clue. Dude, All I, I know is the I got deer. The ha- Listen, I got to have one in the car. Let, let's go open this thing up. I want to see this really bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's we'll have to film that. That'd be crazy, dude. It's so my have one right here. It's a Dude, it's a so weird we had two have shot, man. Yeah, it's a weird shot. Yeah, the like I said, like he saw me, and at that distance, like he had enough time just to turn his head back into his body, and when it did, it just went right through that eye. I'm pretty, I would have, I would have swore like it went through him as much blood as I saw, but I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I just don't I'm get still, it. Dude, I, don't yeah. know. I truly I'm fascinated do not get that. it. I don't get it. Because that much blood, when you found him, did he have a bunch of blood on his face? Yeah. Rudolph. Oh, oh his, <laughs> he looked like Rudolph from 150 yards away. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, I forgot to ask you that earlier. Yeah. Yeah, he was bleeding out of his I mean, I mean, it was bubbly and pink and then bright red at the at the first um, initial you know spot, but all just... Those, you know, bubbles all in the blood and everything else. Dude, man, that's, that's weird. That's so weird. It was very weird. S- shot him with a swacker. Yeah, swacker. Swacker got him. Swacker. <laughs> yeah, that's like the in- most interesting uh, broadhead name, in my opinion. Swacker. Yeah. Mm. Dude, that's crazy, man. Uh, we're running at a couple 20 minutes here on the outro. Um, so, yeah, we're going to go open up this deer in a minute, I guess. But one thing I wanted to ask you all about is that we completely forgot to do when we started this outro is what did you think of that episode? Dude. I told you all it was going to be a good one. It was killer, <laughs> I bro. told you all. Dude, I, I was fired up. Um, I mean, kind of like what I said, you know, a lot of guys, no matter how simple or how complex something is, there's going to be someone that gets something out of this podcast, and they're going to go kill a deer with it. It's, it's going to happen. Uh, right. Yep. You know, we're, I promise you, we'll get a listener success story from yeah. this episode. It, in my opinion, it was a lot like Glenn's because Glenn just like was all right. over the place yeah. and just you know not just like one particular thing. Like he just had just knowledge, you know, a, a broad swath of you know different kind of topics that we covered. I was thinking the same thing while we were recording. I was like, there's so much to un- like you said. There's so much to unpack. Like we could totally get him back on. Like I want to do a video, like we said on the, like after we got off the air. When we go up to uh, Nashville in February for NWTF, we need to meet up with him and do a full video, like breaking down a property and how he looks at it, both on aerial photos and also topography, and like looks at these certain spots. Oh my God, dude! I'm so. You see up. the pictures he's got on uh, camera. He sent me a bunch of them. Holy cow! Oh no, no, he sent me some back in um, uh, crap. When was it? I don't know. Back in September, maybe. That was when y'all was originally trying to get him on. Yeah, yeah, he's like, dude, check this out. I was like, oh, son. Yeah. He's like, I'm like, I see what you're chasing now. Uh-uh. Yep. Yeah, I see. Uh, uh, dude, I love episodes like that, man. I love them. Just like no BS. Mm. Just straightforward. Like, they're, they, like these, they're deer. They're not people. Figure them out. Go out there and kill them. Like, no frills. I love it. So what was y'all's top takeaways from that one? Um, mine, which I'm starting to realize is from guys that like consistently kill big deer year after year for the most part, they're using trail cameras. Cause the thing is you can't, you know, they're, you know, you can get lucky. You can get lucky killing a big deer. That's fine. But it's hard to hunt a spot efficiently 
if you don't know there's a big deer there. Like, right. you'll bounce around too much. Where, like, if you run enough cameras and you have an idea of, like... You can narrow them down. Well, that, but also, like, hey, if I know there's a big deer in here, I'm going to hunt it smarter, and I'm going to try to find and locate that deer. Where if you're not using trail cameras, which, like, what I have been personally doing for the last few years, you just bounce around, like, oh, yeah, this spot looks good. Yeah, I'm going to hunt this. I'm going to hunt that. And you don't put enough time in one area or, like, learn it enough where you can go in and kill that deer like what he's doing. So, I mean, I've got plenty of cameras. I tell them I've got seven, eight cameras that I am very eager to use this just because our season is so long. I mean, postseason, dude, like this place right here when the rut's out in like late November or late, like, you know, mid to late January, dude, we can run those trail cameras out there, find those core areas and go and kill these bucks in late season. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think my top takeaway was uh, trying to focus less on what the deer's, you know, going to do and more about you know what i can do to improve my situation as far as my hunt <clears throat> yeah yeah dude there's I, I loved everything about that about that episode i love talking to guys like that and i guess the main thing for me would definitely be what he was saying about like a deer doesn't know what a core area is a deer doesn't really like they can't use logic and i think that like we forget that all the time um and that like the habitat and everything really is going to determine where that deer is the terrain and the habitat and like where you have that perfect mix where you got the right terrain and the right habitat and the right diversity like there's going to be a big deer there whether it's because a big deer seeks that area out like an older deer seeks that area out or if a deer that happens to live in that area is the deer that just gets old because he's got a lot of stuff going for him whichever one it is um, like he said, I mean, the deer doesn't know he's picking out. I mean, he's not picking that place out, you know, knowing that he's picking it out. It's like nature is, you know, making him gravitate towards that. Yeah. Just out of instinct, I guess. It's like, it's like the, the wood ducks we were hunting this morning. It's like those wood ducks are going to that pond cause that pond is there. It's not like, you know, it's anything other than that. You know, that's, that's the habitat they have. So that's where they're going to land and eat and hang out during the day is that yeah. big 10 acre pond that we hunted this morning somebody throws up a cracker barrel i'm more than likely going to go to it doesn't matter <laughs> if it <laughs> <Yep. laughs> doesn't matter where it's at yep I'm gonna give me a biscuit and gravy boy listen that's go. what i was gonna say it's like get your biscuit and gravy listen now yeah. there you talk grandpa's country breakfast with a biscuit and gravy and you got your eggs over medium and your double mm. hash browns mm, preach preach yep listen you got me excited chicken fried now. chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, listen now. Hey, Waffle um, House is open, too. Oh, dude. oh, don't tempt me. No, but yeah, it's too late. Listen, man. You got to go kill a deer. I got to so, go work I got tomorrow. so much. Andrew's got to get ready for a wedding. I got so much to do. With, nice his, yeah. with, his, uh, with his pretty boy Kafari hat on. Man, he's he's rocking out, man. He's sold out, bro. Straight up sold out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you could say things are getting pretty serious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, yeah, about to get real serious this weekend. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk a little crap about Kafaru, since we're always talking them, talking them up. Something about I don't know what the deal with them is. They my packs have been fine, but all like the accessories I've ordered, like pocket, the pocket and this hat, had they just like it screwed up. Like it, it's taken forever to get it to me. Like the pocket, they sent me the wrong thing, and then they sent me the right thing. And it never got to me. And then they resent it, and it never got to me because they kept putting my ag- address down wrong. And then finally, the third time, it got to me. And it was like a, a month and a half, two months later. I was like, I just waited two months for a medium sized belt pocket. Yep. It's not priority, dude. Nah. But that 22 and then I mag. order that 22 mag, and they're like, shipped in two days. Dude, which is <laughs> sweet, dude. That is such a sweet Which pack. I definitely, pre- dude. Yeah, I packed out that whole buck with the 22 mag, which was a lot heavier than. What I thought it was gonna be. Yeah, Jacob dude, Jacob is the biggest freaking crap talker I've ever <laughs> hung around. He's like, I'm carrying this thing, I'm about to die. You know the freaking hills in there. You killed a bug in there today. You know what the hills yeah. are like. And I am like, I packed that thing out and I went down one up the other. And I'm like, I see Jacob and I just collapse and just like lay there for a minute. I'm like, I'm gonna rest. And he's like, This pack's not that heavy, it's not that hard. And I'm like we start walking back to the truck and we're like 
I don't know, 300 yards from the truck. Yeah. And he said something. And I was like, you want to carry it? He's like, yeah, I'll carry it. I'm like, okay. And so I <laughs> and lay he, it down. He couldn't get up. He's like, he's like a, <laughs> he was like an upside down turtle. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, no, listen. He puts on the ground. I, I literally did not think he was that heavy. Okay? All I can picture is you as the turtle. Bro, listen. He puts it on the ground. He, like, drops on the ground. I'm like, oh, gee. I'm like, oh, my God. This is way heavier than I thought. It shook the earth. Dude, I, I, have to get, I have to sit on the ground and, like, squ- like, squ- like squirm up inside the freaking <laughs> inside the backpack on my back. I'm, like, laying on the ground on my back. I strap it down. And I'm, like, trying to get up. I have no abs, okay? This is not built for abs. So, I, like, lean up. And I'm like, oh, my God. This is going to be horrible. <laughs> and, like, I, like, crawl over on all fours, and finally, like, somehow I get up. I'm like, oh, my God, this is bad. Like, this sucks. How much do you think that weighed? It was heavy, dude. Uh, How much? I don't know. I don't know either. I mean, I, th- I don't know, dude. I don't want to guess. but Over I mean, 60, probably. I, I'll say, when we packed my, our, my, the mule deer out in Wyoming, that's when I was in, like, way better shape. Like, way, like, unbelievable shape compared to where I am now. Like, next level shape. Like, Jacob almost had abs, which is kind of hard to believe. Andrew saw a photo. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But listen. Pretty disturbing. It is. <laughs> I'll show you. It's crazy. Um, and that pack for mine was, I'm I'm no no joke, think it was close to 100 pounds. Yours wasn't that heavy. But then again, I was not nearly in the shape I was when I was in Wyoming. So I don't know how heavy your pack was, but it was heavy enough where I was like, this sucks. Like, just going up a very slight grade. I'm like, <sighs> like, dude, I was talking like freaking Batman. Dude, he's like, he made this, <laughs> he, was, he was like talking in the scariest voice ever. He's like, this pack is so heavy. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, why are you talking like that? He's like, I, he's like I can't breathe. I was like, why are you talking like that? He's like, it conserves air. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really say that? Yes. <laughs> it took more air for me to go talk ahead, normal. Go ahead and talk like yeah, that. I Let's I hear can, it. I can't do it. <laughs> Dude, it was, it it was bad. Dude, if you think like Batman, like like no joke, that's what it sounded like. Yeah, it sounded like I should have. I don't know why I didn't record that. Batman. We're we're walking up like a like a two percent incline <laughs> up to the truck, and he was just he, he's heaving, man. Couldn't do it. I could do it. No, I did. Listen, it was bad though. It sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, so about to throw up. No, I'm about to spit out this beer because it was. You I'm, know. I mean, it, yeah. I wouldn't blame you if you did, um, but yeah, dude, that was that was fun. That was fun. Yeah. Oh, and also I, ha- I was impaled too, so I didn't feel great either. So I was. Oh yeah, with that hip belt on, I was bloody. <laughs> oh yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah, hurt. it hurt really bad. So that's my other that's my other excuse. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty good excuse. Sounds like you got a bunch of them. I did. I specialize <laughs> in them. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> It's, oh, we've hey. been picking on Jacob too much lately. You gotta kill a buck so we can quit picking on you. Okay, listen. All right, guys. So we we gotta leave this out there. Mike, chill, relax, man. Drink the beer. Stop. Don't choke on it. Drink another, Mike. All right, listen, guys. All right, so everybody out there, we've got our new hats in. Okay, we got the leather patch hats, which we've had before. Also have the brand new embroidered blaze orange Southern Outdoorsman hats, which are extremely comfortable. Okay. All right. We have these for sale. They're available. When this episode drops, if you want these hats, if you want a hat for Christmas, stocking stuffer, you want your wife to get it, you want your girlfriend to get it, for you or whatever else, you need to order it, okay? Preferably before, by like Wednesday if you want it by Christmas, okay? We really would appreciate you guys to buy these hats because this is how we're getting to ATA this year. Yeah. So... Or not getting to ATA, depending on how bad you want these hats. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, we it's hope- ridiculously expensive, isn't it? A- yeah, ATA price is, freaking price is- jacked up. I'll talk crap about the ATA all day, man. They jacked up the price like 120% of their media membership, and they didn't do anything extra for media people. Well, they didn't really do anything for media people anyways. So thanks, ATA. Appreciate it. Yeah. But anyway, so we got the new hats. Uh, if you're interested in the hats, uh, just message us uh, through Facebook or Instagram, and we'll get you um, uh, everything situated for that. The leather patch hats are thirty dollars, and the blaze orange are twenty two dollars. So they're really sweet. I really like the blaze orange. I wear that one more than the other, uh, the leather patch, just because we wear blaze orange all season because our time. gun season is so long. Uh, even if we're archery hunting, 
and it's extremely comfortable. Uh, Mike's messing around with it right now, trying to yeah, mess up nice. my bill. <laughs> uh, but anyway, super comfortable hat. I really enjoy it. But yeah, again, buy one or buy both. Uh, get you know, like Andrew said on one of our last episodes, you know, get the leather patch for you know around town, taking your lady out on on the town. Yep. Then get the blaze orange for when you're in the woods, uh, because if you're like us, we got to wear blaze orange quite a bit throughout the season. So. Anyways, we appreciate yeah. the support. So, blah, 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 blah. We appreciate the support on that, and also we appreciate all the listener success stories. Dude, we've been getting, I'm talking, listener success story after listener success story every day for I mean the last three weeks. It's been ridiculous. Uh, we really appreciate it because it's awesome to see that the guys that we have on that we interview are actually helping you all kill more deer and kill bigger deer and kill better deer or even kill your first deer. I mean, shoot, you know, we had one guy, uh, Travis, I forgot Travis, your last name, uh, killed his uh, first buck in over 20 years because he just now got back into hunting. And it was public land too, man. And uh, he really enjoyed it. So we really appreciate all y'all's support. We appreciate that uh, y'all are killing some deer and listening to what we're trying to produce. So yeah, now we just need to start paying attention. <laughs> Yeah, Jake. No, Jacob or Jacob should start paying attention. Jacob, it's your turn, man. You're the last one. I mean, we do get three buck tags. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, so. I fully, dude. I'd love to buck out. I don't care if I have to shoot two more dinks. I'd love to buck out. Andrew's like, give me some spikes, bro. Where the spikes at? Yeah, kill it. Kill a two hundred pound spike. Spikes do, baby. Yeah, right on. Uh, any other conclusions y'all got, Mike? It's been Mike. good having you on once again. Yeah, appreciate it, guys. Yeah, thanks for coming on, man. Mike the um, unrested. Yep. So. Yeah, where yeah, where can people Ooh. find your find your stuff? The unrested. Oh, okay. On <laughs> everything. The unrested. Instagram. YouTube. Uh Instagram is actually the unrested hunting because the unrested was already taken. I wonder yeah. what that profile is like. Whoa, you don't want to check it out. Don't Google it. No, don't search <laughs> that one. <laughs> Anyways, all right, yeah. Check out the Instagram, check out the YouTube channel, check out Facebook Facebook, Facebook as well. Yep. Of course, make sure you're uh, like and subscribe to the Southern Outdoorsman. Of course, if you're listening to this podcast, hopefully you are subscribed to the podcast. Make sure you check us out on Facebook. We're about to break 10,000 followers on Facebook, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, it's pretty slick. And uh, also, I got to say it once again, make sure you're on the Run and Gun Whitetail Hunters page. Uh, oh, tell people about the, the, the dude you just approved to have on there. What? That you just you sent me a screenshot earlier of some dude who requested to join Running Gun White to Hunters. He's like because Jacob Myers. Oh sh- no, no, he didn't say because Jacob Myers. Yes, he did. No, he did not. Yes, he it. did. Look, no, he, he clearly did not read that correctly. Ah, uh, so, dude. All right. Well, anyways, uh, we've been getting a lot of Facebook requests uh, because Jacob Myers has said to every Monday for weeks. What I did not <laughs> see that. <laughs> My man, what is his name? Hey. Let's let's give him a shout out on the podcast. Jordan Morris, you are awesome. That's hilarious. Dude. Oh, he did say that. I didn't even catch that part. What what is your reason to join RGWH? Running gun. If you want to buy slash sell gear, join our running gun classifieds page too. Because Jacob Myers has said to every Monday for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, How did you hear about RGWH? From the best podcast ever. We appreciate that. It's Meat Eater uh, or whoever else. Dude, I'm not going to lie. I love Meat Eater. What is your favorite podcast, Jacob? Uh, for entertain, like, because Meat Eater is not tactics based at all, but it's extremely entertaining. I learn a lot from it. It's mm-hmm. like weird stuff. Yeah. Meat Eater, Joe Rogan, for sure. Joe Rogan's podcast. He just had a new one. Um, crap, I was just listening to it today. Which one is it? Uh, for one of the guys from uh, Life Below Zero, the TV show, he had on. And, dude, it's ridiculous. It's like a three-hour podcast. You know it's a good podcast with Joe when it's like three hours plus. That's when you know it's 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 worth listening oh, to. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, dude, anyways. But, yeah, so those are two of my biggest podcasts I listen to right now. Yeah, uh, You guys are my favorite. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. I mean, as far as tactics and stuff like that, which is what I'm – Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's my go-to. Um, y'all are – I mean, y'all are killing it, knocking it out of the park with these, uh, with these guests y'all got. So – Appreciate Thanks, it, man. Yeah. Whoever's lining set that up. Whoever's lining these jokers up, I mean, y'all are doing a good job. Appreciate it, man. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I don't. I don't really. I don't know. I don't listen to that many podcasts. To be completely honest. Well, for like for my opinion, I think everybody's different. So, like for <coughs> whitetails, I I like listening to more um, 
tactic based podcast just because I don't care about whitetail hunting stories all that much. Yeah, I don't either. But like when it comes to like western hunting, like I like western hunting. Like when it comes to tactics, but I also like some of the stories because some of them are crazy. Yeah. And then like you have some podcasts where it's like a hunting podcast, but they just like they interview people that's like. It's not tactic based, which is like meat eater. That's exactly like what meat eater is like. Um, yeah, we forgot to mention your heart. Oh, we got to oh, talk about that real no. quick. Yeah, we got to talk about. So Andrew had his heart broken tonight. He got crushed underneath a uh, four thousand pound truck. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I forgot to. I meant to tell that in the story earlier, but uh, since he's getting married, I was like, "Well, I'm going to give Andrew a gift. Uh, wedding, wedding, you know, present." So I took the heart and our. our I wrapped it in my sweater, and I put it in the truck, and I brought it to Andrew, and I gave it to him. And Andrew wanted to see the buck, so he put the he put my hoodie down, and it had the heart inside of it. Well, then his parents needed room to uh, park in the driveway, so uh, I was like, hey, I, you know, do you want me to park it back on the street? And, uh, he said, yeah. So I jump in, and I put it in reverse and pull over there, and I'm like, where's this heart at? And I was like looking around. I was like looked in the back of the truck. I looked the inside of the truck. I was like, you know, I, was, I could not find it anywhere. I go on the other side of his dad's truck where I was parked. Andrew's heart is completely destroyed. destroyed. I mean, I mean, it's smashed. I mean, it's just for, put it in the grind pile, man. It's good. It's got some it's rubber. Go. It's yeah. I, I ran over it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I ran over his heart. <laughs> I mean, it was smashed to pieces. Inside of your hoodie, too. Yeah, inside of my hoodie. My hoodie's <laughs> covered in blood. <laughs> he gave it to me in the <laughs> Penetrated. Like, you keep the hoodie, too, bud. <laughs> oh, dude, that, that stain is never coming out. It's yeah. compressed into that fabric. Yeah, that was pretty good. Well. <laughs> All right. I guess that about wraps All right, so so what, what you learned from this episode is everything Josh talked about. Buy a Southern Outdoorsman hat. Join the Run Gun page and that uh, Michael breaks, breaks hearts. <laughs> Michael's a little heartbreaker. Yep. A little heart runner over. All right, everybody. Um, go kill a buck this week. It's Christmas. So, Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs>